Thank you, Jordan. Yeah, I'm still struggling with understanding how that's not good. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Baltzell. I'm the statewide salmon and steelhead manager for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Would like to welcome everybody to our North of Falcon One meeting. Um, this is a follow up from our forecast preview session that happened a couple weeks ago. Um, with this one, we will, uh, Chad, go ahead and forward on a couple slides. <clears throat> with this meeting today, uh, we're going to go through some. Uh, an overview of the North of Falcon process for those of you who are new or online, um, a review of the forecasts and management objectives uh, and the stocks of concern for this year. We'll be going over the uh, ocean options that came out of the Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting that ended last Friday. Uh, we'll talk through some preliminary modeling results and what that might mean for this year's fisheries. Uh, from there, we're going to do a couple different breakout sessions today, one for commercial fisheries and one for Puget Sound recreational fisheries, where we will dive a little deeper into the modeling results and uh, potential fishery seasons that we would like to put in a, a, an initial proposal for this year to model with the co-managers. So with that, uh, just a reminder for folks online, we are doing this as a, a hybrid meeting today. Um, so for folks online, uh, you'll need to raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, I believe star six is the hand raise and star nine is the mute and unmute, but maybe I got that backwards. Uh, uh, and for folks in the room, uh, because we are hybrid, if you do have a question, uh, raise your hand. Somebody from up here will call on you, and we'd ask that you come up to the table, uh, speak into the microphone, and uh, ask your question so everybody can hear you. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to kick it over to Kyle Addix, who's going to walk through the North Falcon process. Thanks, Mark. I'm Kyle Addix. I'm the Intergovernmental Salmon Manager for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, as Mark kind of mentioned, we went through a lot of this sort of intro se session material um, in this very room just a couple of weeks ago, so we're going to fly through it pretty fast. And when we get to questions for the this session, please try to keep them to specific questions related to what we present here. There'll be plenty of time for um, more detailed fishery questions in the breakout sessions, but we really want to move into those quickly to have time to dig into those details. Um, so what is North of Falcon? It's the annual cooperative process that we use to set salmon seasons in Washington waters. And the name, name refers to waters north of Cape Falcon in Oregon, which marks the southern border of Washington's management of salmon stocks. And it's just one component of a larger salmon season setting process that um, also involves state, tribal governments, federal regulators, other U.S. states, notably Oregon, California, Alaska, and the Canadian government as well. This is a um, general North of Falcon calendar. We, we walked a little through this um, here a couple of weeks ago. We're past the first three or so steps in this process. We've developed the forecast with our co-managers. We had our um, meeting to unveil those forecasts to the public. And we have had a week-long Pacific, Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting in SeaTac last week, where the council set initi initial alternatives for ocean fishing in the waters off the coast. And we're now into that fourth March step here where we're having a series of public meetings and we'll have meetings for the coast, for the Columbia River. This meeting today is really focused on Puget Sound sport and commercial fisheries. Um, over the next month, we'll be developing draft seasons, modeling those with our tribal co-managers and trying to figure out um, what we can, what fisheries we can have this year with our conservation objectives. And then we'll move into that April Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting where the council will adopt the final um, ocean fishing package and we'll finalize our, our proposed seasons for inside waters as well. Next slide, Chad. There are a whole bunch of things we have to consider as we move through the North of Falcon process. We have treaty obligations under the Pacific Salmon Treaty that affect fisheries from Southeast Alaska to Oregon. We have the Pacific Fishery Management Council process, which I mentioned, which sets fisheries for ocean waters. And we have our inside co-manager processes um, with the co-managers in Western Washington, the USV Washington Treaty area, as well as the Columbia River, the USV Oregon area. But we also have to consider Endangered Species Act constraints, our Fish and Wildlife Commission's policies. Um, as I mentioned, we have obligations under the Pacific Salmon Treaty. And we do this um, 
fishery management as co-management with the tribes. They manage their own fisheries. We manage ours, but we share data and split harvest with our, uh, our co-managers. And we have an extensive system of monitoring and evaluation for fisheries statewide, which really um, drive the whole system as we assess what our returns are, what our fisheries catch were and catches were, and use that for forecasting and future years planning. With that, I'm gonna hand it off to Dr. Kirsten Simonson, who's gonna give a quick overview of the just high level forecast recaps for this year. Thanks, Kyle. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so just kind of a real quick review since we kind of went into a lot more detail about this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, for Puget Sound Chinook, the natural stocks are down 29% and those hatchery stocks are up 34% from the most recent 10 year average. Coastal Chinook's natural stocks are up 8% and hatchery stocks are up 7% from the recent 10 year average. Um, and both of those are slightly down from the 2022 forecasts. For Columbia River Chinook, the forecasts for spring and summer Chinook have both increased relative to 2022 forecasts um, and the actual returns. Uh, in the lower river system, hatchery and upriver bright stocks are slightly improved relative to last year's forecast, um, and the Bonneville pool hatchery forecast is significantly higher than last year's forecast. Moving to Coho, uh, for Puget Sound Coho, the natural stocks are up about 6% and hatchery stocks are up 50% from the 10-year average. For coastal Coho, the natural stocks are up 53% and hatchery stocks are up 100% from the 10-year average. Uh, the natural stocks are up 2% and the hatchery stocks are up 30% as relative to the 2022 forecasts. Um, for Columbia River Coho, uh, there are strong forecasts for 2023 um, of just over, just shy of 810,000 fish. Um, and this is slightly down from last year's forecast, which was up over 876,000 fish. So uh, for, for pink salmon, for Puget Sound pinks, uh, the forecast is up about 1% from the 10-year average, and the Puget Sound total is forecast to be a, about 3.95 million pink salmon. For Puget Sound chum, uh, the natural stocks are down 40%, and the hatchery stocks are down 56% from the 10-year average. Uh, the, the Puget Sound fall chum total was about 651,000 fish. For uh, coastal chum in Willapa, the forecast is down about 8% and the Grace Harbor is up about 21% from the 10 year average. And finally, looking at sockeye, uh, the Baker Lake sockeye forecast is about on par with the most recent 10 year average. It's about 31,000 fish. For Lake Washington sockeye, the forecast is down 65% from the 10 year average. And that forecast is about 22,000 fish. For Columbia River sockeye, uh, the Wenatchee stock is down about 35% from the most recent 10-year average. Uh, the Okanagan stock is down about 23% from the most recent 10-year average. And the total Columbia River forecast is uh, forecast to be about 235,000 fish. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to Dr. Derek Dapp, who's going to walk us through some of the management objectives. Thank you, Kirsten. And I'll be presenting these jointly with Angelica Hagenbrough, who will be doing the coho side of this, and I'll be doing the Chinook side. Um, before jumping into the management objectives, just a reminder to folks, there's two primary management objective styles that we're looking at as we're looking at um, uh, individual stocks. We're looking at either exploitation rates, which in this and subsequent slides will be labeled as an ER, um, or we're looking at escapement or some combination of the two. So uh, an exploitation rate for folks who might be new to this process, it's basically the percentage of the adult abundance that's removed in either a fishery or a grouping of fisheries. And as we're looking at the different management criteria, there'll be different um, uh, metrics of ER that we'll be looking at. A total exploitation rate, for example, represents the um, total adult abundance taken uh, across all fisheries in the modeling. Uh, an SUS exploitation rate stands for a Southern US exploitation rate, and that represents basically uh, fishery impacts that are south of the west coast of Vancouver Island. And then, um, and then there's also sometimes a pre-terminal um, SUS exploitation rate, and that represents uh, fisheries south of west coast Vancouver Island, uh, but only in the uh, only in the marine areas. So kind of as we're looking through that, maybe starting off with the ocean and Columbia River management objectives. Uh, for Chinook, really the primary constraining stock in the ocean is the lower Columbia natural toolies. Um, and this year we have a 38% total exploitation rate objective. Angelica, did you wanna walk us through the coho objectives? Sure, I can do that. Um, good afternoon, my name is Angelica hagen -Bro. And uh, I'm happy to be here today. And as far as coho uh, management objectives go, um, we have uh, for uh, lower 
uh, interior Fraser, it's 10%, and it's been 10% for many years, so that's that's not surprising. For um, Oregon Coast Natural, it's 20%, but going into uh, the Puget Sound area, we have a 40% objective for the Strait of Juan de Fuca, which is double what we had last year because the abundance came in higher, uh, significantly higher than last year, so uh, with this uh, the management objective increased from 20% to 40%. Hood Canal Natural have the same management objective as last year. We're at 45%. Uh, Skagit is our problem child this year. Uh, the abundance is uh, significantly reduced. And instead of having a 60% uh, exploitation rate objective, we're down uh, at 35%. Uh, still a Guamish, um, is in uh, moderate status with a 50% um, exploitation rate objective and Snohomish um, is at 40%, just, just as last year. So we have one stock that's down, Skagit, one stock where the management objective is up and that's the Strait of Juan de Fuca for Puget Sound. And as far as the coast goes, everything looks good. Um, the abundances are quite high. Uh, for some stocks a little lower, but for most stocks higher, and uh, it doesn't appear that we would have a coastal stock constraining us this year. Thanks, Angelica. So uh, moving on to the next slide for the Chinook management objectives um, in Puget Sound. Um, I won't go through all of these, and we'll definitely get into the modeling a little bit more, both in the breakout session and in the coming slides. Um, but um, kind of uh, one of the main stocks that we expect to be a constrainer on the side of Chinook this year is Stillaguamish, as it's been in recent years. Uh, the Stillaguamish forecast is slightly improved relative to recent years, but we are still below that low abundance threshold category. So um, that necessitates a 9% unmarked southern U.S. maximum exploitation rate and a 14% marked S.U.S. maximum exploitation rate. Kind of highlighting two other stocks here that um, uh, we should be thinking about as we're going through the modeling exercises. Um, Kirsten had uh, mentioned in the forecast meeting that Nisqually, uh, the hatchery forecast is down by about 5,000 fish. And we see here that Nisqually is defined as a 47% total exploitation rate plus a 2% for an experimental fishery conducted by the tribe. But, um, but um, there is a chance that um, kind of as we implement fisheries for 2023, um, that could fall below the low abundance threshold, uh, necessitating a change to that, that exploitation rate objective. So that's going to be one stock that we're paying attention to as we're going through the modeling. Another stock that we'll be paying close attention to is the um, Skagit Springs, which right now are highlighted as having a 36% total exploitation rate objective. In recent years, the Skagit Springs have, um, have had uh, uh, kind of forecasts that are just on the cusp of that low abundance threshold. And it is possible once again, once, once we start adding in fisheries that we could see that objective uh, uh, fall to a lower SUS metric. Maybe if we can move on to the next slide, Chad, and. Uh, Flip back to Angelica. I think Angelica started to cover some of the coho objectives in Puget Sound. But if there's anything else that you wanted to add, Angelica? Um, yeah, maybe just um, and if it hasn't come across yet, Skagit is definitely a constrainer as far as it looks now. Granted, Skagit has a lot of exploitation in the terminal area, but we're at approximately 47 percent in some of the runs that we have done. We haven't updated our Puget Sound fisheries in these runs. So a lot is in flux at this point, uh, especially with adding pink fisheries. But this is definitely a stock to watch this year. Um, Thompson in the high option, that uh, Canadian stock was over 10%. I think it was at 10.3%. Uh, we do know that uh, once we enter the Canadian forecast, the Thompson stock will go down, the exploitation rate might go down by as much as 1% with the new higher Canadian forecast. So that's that's positive. And as I mentioned, coastal stocks uh, look good, but because there's a lot in flux, things that look good now may not look so good once we enter everybody's fisheries. One that might potentially uh, go higher is Hood Canal. Right now, the stock looks good, but once all the fisheries go in, that might it might look a little different. Thanks, Angelica. And now if we can move to the next slide and talk a little bit about um, what's in kind of the current modeling exercises that we've been looking at. Um, so as Kyle mentioned, uh, we just concluded our uh, uh, PFMC process last week. And coming out of that process, we have three uh, ocean alternatives uh, for fisheries in, uh, in the PFMC area. Uh, and those alternatives are on screen now compared to uh, 2022. 
You can see in alternative uh, uh, one, two, and three for Chinook, uh, we have a um, proposed non-treaty quota of 8,500 or 85,000 Chinook, 75,000 Chinook, and 65,000 Chinook. And for Coho, we have proposed uh, non-treaty ocean quotas of 200,000, 185,000, and 170,000. Maybe just briefly touching um, on when we look at the coming slides that are related to the current modeling outputs. Um, Angelica had mentioned that right now, um, some of the modeling for coho does not include uh, Canadian fisheries and Canadian forecasts uh, for Chinook. Uh, we are still missing some of the Canadian fisheries in the modeling for 2023. Um, those would be um, the West Coast Vancouver Island fisheries, uh, troll and sport, as well as the Northern British Columbia troll and sport fisheries. Uh, in addition, Southeast Alaska is not yet in the modeling, the 2023 input uh, for Chinook. Um, and uh, all three of those inputs, the Southeast Alaska, Northern British Columbia, and uh, West Coast Vancouver Island inputs will be kind of added in sometime around the end of March or early April as we complete our annual CTC modeling exercises, part of our Northern process. Um, so, um, once again, as Angelica mentioned, kind of in the modeling right now, we also don't have any fisheries uh, added in for um, uh, 2023 for Puget Sound, so no state or tribal fisheries there just yet. The other fisheries, which are generally a relatively small impact on Puget Sound, but just to make folks aware, um, we don't have some of our coastal terminal area fisheries in the model yet, such as Grays Harbor or Willapa or, uh, or in the river systems. So um, on screen now is um, kind of looking maybe first at some of the ocean and Columbia River preliminary modeling results, um, starting with Chinook. Um, compared to that 38% exploitation rate objective for lower Columbia natural toolies, currently the high ocean option is coming out at 39.1%. So just a, a, a tad above the middle and low ocean options uh, do meet those objectives. Um, if you are interested kind of in the modeling results and you're someone in the room, we do have handouts with more information available um, on the table uh, on the right side of the room. Angelica, did you want to walk through some of the ocean and coho uh, stocks, how they're coming out in the preliminary modeling results? Yeah, um, I can add a little bit. There's, it's not too exciting, but I think the, the ocean options, high option, we have uh, 200,000 a quota for the ocean, the non-treaty quota, mid option 185, and the low option is at 170,000. And usually for the ocean, we look at coastal stocks can get quite constraining such as cleats, and this is not the case this year. And the other stock that sometimes uh, comes up as a constraint are uh, lower Columbia naturals. And that stock is also currently well below its management objectives. We also look at uh, Oregon Coast Natural Coho, and uh, I think in option one, it's right at the new management objective, which went from 15 to 20 percent, but that is by design. So uh, as far as uh, ocean fisheries and, and coho management objectives go, things look pretty good right now. So moving into some of the uh, Chinook modeling um, coming uh, for, for now Puget Sound focused um, and uh, speaking to some of the stocks that we were highlighting earlier during the management object objective uh, portion of the presentation. Um, first, looking at Stiligwamish and what we're looking at here, once again, on the far, uh, far right side, we're looking at the high ocean option outputs from that in initial model run. Once again, 2023 Puget Sound fisheries are not included in that. But, uh, but 2023 ocean fisheries uh, are. So um, what we see here is uh, Nooksack Springs preliminarily coming out above the 10.9% SUS management objective. It's currently coming out in that high ocean option at 12.5%, so a little above. Skagit Summer Falls uh, is in a low abundance tier this year, and we're seeing kind of a preliminary modeling result coming out at 19.5% uh, Southern US exploitation rate compared to a 17% Southern US exploitation rate objective. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Skagit, uh, Skagit Springs um, are right on the cusp of that low abundance threshold. So um, it'll be interesting to see kind of once we add in those 2023 uh, Puget Sound inputs, how that may or may not affect um, uh, kind of their abundance category. For Stiligwamish coming out of these high ocean option runs, we are slightly above the 9% uh, unmarked SUS objective and 14% uh, marked SUS objective. Snohomish is coming out slightly above the 8.3% SUS um, objective at currently at 9.5 in the modeling. 
um, Nisqually um, is actually um, um, still, um, it, it seems to be within its parameters at the moment, but once again, we are going to be paying attention to that one and seeing if kind of the addition of 2023 Puget Sound fisheries uh, affects that abundance here. And um, I think um, the last one to mention here uh, in the preliminary modeling is Skokomish, which is coming out at 51.3% on the total uh, versus an objective of 50% on the total. And then Angelica, did you want to go over the COHO modeling for Puget Sound? Yeah, as far as the constrainers, and I was probably going to repeat myself, uh, Skagit is the most constraining stock currently where we have an exploitation rate in a high option of 48% with a management objective of 35. Another potential constrainer could be the Canadian uh, Thompson stock. As I said, um, in option one, we're at 103 we expect savings once the new Canadian inputs the British Columbia forecasts and fisheries get entered in the model, but those savings could easily be sucked up somewhere else. Uh, that might be a stock that will uh, come up as a constraining stock. And uh, because we have, don't have the Puget Sound fisheries in yet, uh, and we're expecting pink fisheries, other stocks could potentially uh, become constrainers such as Hood Canal potentially, but a lot is, st is still up in the air. So up on the screen, you're gonna see a list of upcoming meetings. Uh, we have a uh, co-manager meeting tomorrow uh, with us and the treaty tribes uh, to go over uh, preliminary modeling results after today's meeting. Um, from there, uh, starting next Monday, uh, we're going to have a uh, North Coast uh, Straits uh, Hood Canal and Puget Sound sport fishing discussion in the evening via Zoom. Uh, that month, although it's not up on the screen, there's also a, a PFMC public hearing about ocean options in Westport on Monday. On Tuesday, we'll have a Willapaw Bay fisheries discussion via Zoom starting at 6. On uh, Wednesday, uh, we had to reschedule our Columbia River meeting. So, uh, sorry, that's next Tuesday. Uh, we had to reschedule our Columbia River meeting. So that will be on the 21st. Uh, and that is a hybrid meeting. Uh, so it'll be Zoom and at Ridgefield. Um, also that day, we have the Willapaw Bay uh, discussion. Then on Wednesday, we have Grays Harbor Fisheries discussion followed by uh, another Puget Sound uh, marine and uh, freshwater uh, fisheries discussion on Thursday of next week. Next slide, please. Uh, and then following that, sorry, let me scroll down here a little bit. Following that, uh, we'll have our North of Falcon number two meeting in Linwood, Washington uh, on the 29th. Uh, we'll try to uh, center in on uh, kind of a preferred fisheries packages heading to the, the final PFMC week in Foster City. Uh, on the 29th also will be the Upper Columbia and Snake River um, fisheries discussion that'll actually be in person in Kennewick. Uh, there will also be, as in recent years, there'll also be a video presentation about fisheries options available online as well. On the 30th, uh, before we wrap up and head to California, we will have a joint Willapaw Bay Grays Harbor fishery discussion uh, via Zoom at 6 p.m., and then, as I said, uh, the PFMC, the final PFMC meeting where fisheries packages will be finalized will be in Foster City, California, uh, starting on the 2nd uh, and going through the 7th. Uh, we will have morning update uh, meetings uh, starting on Monday the 3rd at 9 a.m. every morning. And again, I would just encourage folks, if you're interested or you may not have gotten all these dates or times, we've got a lot of information on our website. Also, the website is where you're going to be able to provide public comment on any of these fishing seasons, proposed packages, or elsewhere. Uh, there is a link in a portal there for you to provide comment on any of these fisheries options. So with that, we'll take a quick pause here and see if there's any questions in the audience that we can answer, and then we will head straight into our breakout sessions today. And I'm not seeing any hands in the room. Do we have any online, Leah? No, I'm not seeing any online. I just want to remind everybody that uh, star nine to raise your hand if you're on the phone. We have one in the room, Shannon.
Um, yeah, so I'm looking at this, uh, uh, these wonderful spreadsheets and I'm uh, looking at the interior Fraser River um, row and I see three options, one, two, and three in column fashion. Um, but I, I guess I'm kind of perplexed here. I, I don't see a, a run size that we could work with. So, I mean, I see uh, harvestable US exploitation rates, but what's the number, you know? So I think I've got that question that that I hope you guys could have an answer for. So, um, and then the only other thing, are, are we completely done in the Grace Harbor uh, with commercial gill netting? So those are my two questions. Well, I'll take the first one. Yeah. Uh, no, we're not done. Uh, we did uh, have uh, a fair number of gill net days in the Harbor last year, um, I believe. Uh, Preseason forecasts are slightly down from last year, but but pretty similar. And I would expect that we'll be planning those uh, uh, those fishery days as we can yeah. um, through this preseason. So that that's coho, correct? Oh, that's wonderful news. Um, and as far as a run size number, I'm not sure that we have an exact uh, run size number for Fraser. We are capped at that ten point or ten percent exploitation. Right. Um, I'm sure. Uh, Angelica could probably dig out some numbers, but I'm not sure that we get an exact forecast. I think it's a conglomerate of, of forecasts that make up that that interior Fraser Thompson number. Right. So we maybe do. we can uh, circle up back with you. Yeah, I think so, it's a forecast. It's 87,000, which 87, is uh, similar to last year, and it's a pretty good forecast for um, upper Fraser Thompson stock. Yeah. So I guess my concern here is, is that when we go to uh, Point Roberts to fish uh, chum salmon, and we don't get many of those up there, that's the uh, non-treaty guys. Um, uh, there always seems to be a, uh, an issue with coho, meaning, you know, we got to throw them back and uh, no fishermen, no commercial fisherman ever wants to throw a fish overboard, you know. So if you could, uh, in our discussions, if we could uh, figure out, give us a number to work with there on the coho, that'd be great. Thanks. So again, Leah, any hands online? Nope, I am not seeing any online. I didn't see a hand, but someone walked up to the table in the room. Again, if we could keep this really specific to this presentation, if we want to get into fishery specific stuff, we're trying to hold that for the breakouts. Good afternoon. My name is Alex Van Hine. Um, so on the Thompson River question there, Shannon, just uh, some information that I received was that 2018, uh, the lower Fraser received 118% uh, compared to their forecast. 19, they received 134% to their forecast. 2020, they received 208.5% compared to their forecast. Uh, 2021, they received 198% compared to their forecast. So uh, if that gives us any indication of how the Thompson River is doing, then I, I think they're, they're doing just fine. Thanks. This run has been building over the last few years. And whenever you have a run that has a building run size, it takes a while for the forecast to catch up. So that might be part of the problem that uh, results in under forecasting, but the forecasts have steadily gone up as well. Thanks, Angelica. Well, with that, I think we'll move to our breakouts. We didn't talk about how long a break we wanted to take given this was a short session, but probably five minutes is good to get um, the commercial interest group over there. Um, Puget Sound Recreational stay here. If there's anybody that wants to talk about anything else, grab me on the side. We can figure out who's here and who the best person to talk to you is. So we'll take a five minute, let's call it seven minutes, get back at 140.
that's still running the computer here. Yeah. 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 Where's Chad? Just advance that slide. Just advance chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, good morning, or sorry, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get started again. Um, again, my name is Mark Baltzell, statewide salmon and steelhead manager. Uh, we've got a, a little bit different flavor to start off this meeting this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Kirsten Simonson, our recreational fishery manager, has been uh, uh, conducting a, a gear study here for the last couple of years. Um, we uh, recently have been doing some evaluation of that gear study. We wanted to share a little bit about that with you. I know we've been talking about it with our advisors and other recreational constituents, as well as our co-managers over the last couple of years. So we're going to just do a really quick run through today of some of the preliminary results before we jump into the fishing seasons. So uh, we really appreciate your indulgence here. We, we think it's um, uh, a really good study so far. We're excited to carry it on into the future and excited to share this info with you. So with that, Kirsten. Thanks so much. <clears throat> So just a quick kind of outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give some kind of basic intro and background as to what kind of led us to start doing this study. Uh, we did start with a 2021 pilot study that was kind of a short duration study where we started to kind of gather this data and look at it. And then we kind of updated the methodology and our approach as we went along. So I'll kind of give you the, the most recent version of that. I'm not going to talk too much about the pilot study, but just know that there's, this has been a progression and kind of a, an evolution of this project as it's gone along. And then we'll kind of wrap it up with some just discussion and looking ahead as to kind of what's going to happen next. So uh, with that, I'll just kind of jump right into it. So Gear is, has been traditionally used as a management tool in fisheries for, you know, fisheries around the world, all over the place, different types of fisheries. So um, in commercial fisheries, this looks like things like having turtle excluding devices, back, bycatch reduction devices um, on nets, um, things like, you know, TEDs in the Gulf of Mexico fisheries and up here closer to home, things like salmon excluder devices in midwater trawl data, uh, fisheries up in the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea. Um, it could look like things like mesh, mesh size restrictions in gillnet fisheries or hook size or number limitations in longline fisheries. For recreational fisheries, for those of folks in the room and online, you, you um, understand that there's limitations on the type of gear you can use in a recreational fishery, and this could be just as simple as limiting to hook and line or spear fishing. Um, and there, there's also been some exploration of looking at hook size limitation in fisheries around the world. Uh, this is a study that I found in the Mediterranean where they were looking at using hook size as a way to reduce mortality of uh, discards. So there's, these are things that there's precedent for studying them and including them in the discussion of recreational fisheries. Here in the Puget Sound for our salmon fisheries, uh, we know that we're limited to kind of handheld uh, rod and line for recreational fisheries. Um, and of course, we all know that there's we're limited to also using single barbless hooks. So these are gear restrictions and gear kind of limitations that exist already. And these are all part of the selective gear rules package that exists for Puget Sound salmon fisheries. So why are we talking about gear? Well, in uh, us, we know that sublegal encounters have been a concern in Puget Sound recreational salmon fisheries for a number of years. And this is particularly true in winter fisheries. And especially for area 10, which has kind of had the most consistent winter fisheries over the last several years. But we also know that this fishery does tend to have a high number of sublegal encounters associated with it. In 2021, the winter fishery closed early due to the number of sublegal encounters that were found there. And there was also high sublegal encounter rates in both 2017 and 2019. And just last year in 2022, that fishery was paused early due to sublegal encounters as well before it was subsequently opened back up again later in the season when that sublegal encounter number came back down. So it's long been suggested that one way to kind of mitigate this, this encounter rate for sublegals is to use certain gear types or sizes that could reduce your sublegal encounter rate. And it's kind of the adage of bigger gear gets bigger fish. So we just set out to, to test this quantitatively. So the goals for this study were really to understand the relationship between gear type, gear size, and hook size, 
and the size of Chinook salmon caught in the recreational fisheries in Puget Sound. And then to explore whether recommendations can be made to reduce the number of sublegal encounters, particularly in Puget Sound winter fisheries. So kind of, I'm just gonna touch briefly on the pilot study that started in 2021. And again, as I said, that winter fishery in area 10 closed in mid-January of 2021 due to the high sublegal encounter rate. Test fishing, however, was still conducted in that area between January and March, despite the fishery closure. So we use this as an opportunity to start testing this idea that, uh, that Chinook size could be related to gear. And we had about six weeks of test fishing data that contained gear information that we could kind of use to base this off of. So then we kind of wrap this into a more extensive pilot study for that year. So first things first, it was important that no changes were made to the normal test fishing operations. So because test fishing is such an important management tool for Puget Sound fisheries, we wanted to make sure that we weren't kind of taking away from the original purpose of test fishing, which is to understand the legal marked encounter rate of, of uh, Chinook in Puget Sound. So we didn't want to, um, we also didn't want to have an experimental element to this because the, the test fishing is meant to mimic the fleet. So we didn't want to kind of change up what they were doing because again, the most important thing for the test fishery to be doing is what their normal operations are. But we did add kind of a layer of data collection to what they were already doing that included um, detailed information on fishing methodology. So this included gear type and whether or not they were fishing with plugs, spoons, hoochies, jigs, or bait, which is kind of the primary tools, obviously, as everybody here knows, that are used in the recreational fishery. And then we added information on gear size, and this was basically just the actual size of the lure that's being used, so anything for ranging from about one inch to about seven inches. And finally, hook size. So this initial six-week pilot program that was done in the winter was then expanded to include summer fisheries. So we were able to expand the data collection from just that small area 10 winter fishery uh, to all the areas that had fisheries in that in the summer of 2021. Um, and we kind of used area 10 as kind of a, a just a, a small subset of that whole year to kind of start examining uh, data analysis te techniques and just kind of use it as a snapshot of kind of what was going on out there. And that's basically because we had the most data points from Area 10 in general, the most test fishing happens there. Uh, so we just kind of have the most information. And we also have the summer versus winter comparison that we could make. And basically what we did is ex examined the relationship between the total length, so the actual size of the fish with gear type, gear size, and hook size. And again, I said, I'm not going to go into super um, in de into detail about kind of the techniques we used for this, but if anybody is curious about how we did it, you please come find me later on. So just to kind of briefly run through what the findings were from that original study, we did find that hook size was not nearly important as gear type and gear size. So moving forward, we eliminated that from our data collection. We did find that there was pretty big seasonal differences in the relationship between gear and Chinook length. We also found that removing gear size and gear um, and hook size and just looking at gear type, we did see some patterns. So just to kind of orient you to this slide, on the X axis, we have gear type and we have here uh, hoochies, plugs and spoons. On the Y axis, we have total length. So the actual length of the fish that were collected. The black solid line is the average size of a Chinook that was caught during the, uh, the area 10 summer, uh, summer and winter fisheries in, area, in 2021. And the dashed line is 56 centimeters, which is legal size for a Chinook. So that's uh, 22 inches, um, just to kind of orient you to what's happening here. The pink bar uh, box plot is summer fisheries and the blue is winter. And so we could see a couple of patterns here. And basically just that th what this key finding here is that spoons are generally catching smaller size fish than other gear types. But there are a lot of confounding factors in this outcome, um, namely the type of gear that's being used, the size of the gear, uh, the area that's being fished and the season. So this kind of led us to take an entirely different approach to how we looked at this data analysis. So now kind of moving into the full study and the updated methodology that was used, we decided to take a probabilistic approach to this analysis. So instead of using a linear model, which originally just modeled the size of the fish to the variables that we were collecting, we switched the question around and asked, what is the probability of catching a legal sized fish in this, these fisheries using a certain gear type? So to do this, we employed a logistic regression. So for those of you who are maybe not as statistically oriented, you might want to just like tune out for the next like two slides or so, because I'm going to get kind of into the modeling a little bit here. So a, log a logistic regression um, models binomial responses to a set of independent variables. And a binomial response just basically means there is one of two objectives or one of two outcomes, right? It's an either or situation. So you either pass or fail a test. 
you have a yes or no answer. You have a zero or a one. You have one of two options that you can possibly come out with. And so it's basically, will an event occur given a known set of variables? So the range of responses that you get when you fit this model is between zero and one. And the result is the probability that some event Y will happen given a certain condition X or a set of conditions X1, X2, X3, et cetera. And so to give a really simple example of what this looks like, here we can just see a, a small table of, um, that includes hours spent studying and whether or not you pass or fail an exam. So we here we have passes, the outcome is one and fail is the outcome is zero. And we have here the number of hours you're studying. And if we plot this, you can see this kind of quintessential S-shaped curve that's really kind of just associated with logistic regressions. This is when you model them, this is what they, what they look like. So you can kind of see that on the low end of that, the less hours you spend studying, the, the lower your probability is of passing an exam, whereas the more hours you spend studying, the higher probability you have of passing an exam. And so why do we use this type of technique? Well, here you can see that you could fit a linear regression to this, so just kind of modeling a straight line here. Um, but we can see that what your predicted value could, could extend outside your range of possible responses, right? So you can't more than pass a test and you can't more than fail a test. So the kind of the range here is in between that. And I say that, but I do know there was a kid in my seventh grade English test class who did get a negative one on a spelling test. So you can kind of more than fail a spelling test, but uh, I digress. So logistic regression kind of gives you a range of responses that are kind of in between those possible outcomes. So what does this model look like? Well, first, the questions now became, what is the probability of catching a legal size fish using certain gear in the Puget Sound recreational salmon fisheries? So the first thing we did is we converted the total length of the fish that were caught to whether or not it was legal or sublegal. So there's our binomial outcome. It's either one or the other. So a legal was designated as one and a sublegal was designated as zero. So we did two different models. The first is a univariate approach, meaning we had one covariate. So we mo modeled whether or not legal was, um, was uh, kind of, sorry, we modeled legal against what the catch area, and then we modeled the probability of legal against the gear type, and then probability of legal against the gear size. And then the second model took a multivariate approach. So now we combined all of these uh, variates together, and we have a, had a, a much bigger model that included gear type, gear size, and then the interaction between gear type and gear size. So what does this look like? So the first thing I want to kind of acknowledge here is some caveats in this data. So what this data does tell us is the estimated probability of catching legal size Chinook based on gear choices. So what this does not tell us is the differences in catch between wild and hatchery fish. We did not use mark status as a covariate in here, so we have no idea if there's a differences between wild and hatchery origin fish. And this is also not going to tell us where and when to open fisheries. So this should not be used as a planning tool, but instead as a guidance for making gear choices within a fishery that is already open. Obviously, we know that there's a lot of information that goes into opening a fishery, and gear choice is kind of a result of the back end of that. Once a fishery is already happening, what can we do within that fishery? So the full data set here included, again, data from both 2021 and 2022. Here we could see a figure that shows uh, the just the number of encounters for um, all of the different catch areas. And we had data from catch areas, uh, marine areas 5, 7, 9, 10, and 11. And on the top panel shows summer, uh, summer data, and the bottom panel shows winter. And you can see that the blue represents sublegal encounters, and the red represents legal encounters. And so you can kind of just see some differences in the numbers of, of encounters between different catch areas and between summer and winter. This data set contained over 2,600 data points from all of the areas over the course of two years. This included just shy of 1,700 data points for summer fisheries and about 925 data points from winter fisheries. And I will say that the final data set here uh, eliminated any gear type and size combinations per area per season with an N of less than 10. So if there was less than 10 encounters with a certain combination, we kicked it out of the data set, basically just because the model didn't converge. Uh, our confidence intervals there included zero and one, which means that it was not a, a good fit to the data, can't fit the data properly. So this is, uh, so there, there is some limitations in the, the data set here as well. So looking at kind of the sample spread, so this is representing summer samples, and I just kind of want to give you an idea of what this data looked like kind of spread around the Puget Sound. <clears throat> so out in area five, you can see that we had um, a, a 
the two different gear types that were used primarily were hoochies and spoons. You can see the different spread of gear sizes associated with each of those. And the N is the number of encounters associated with each of those gear size combinations in that marine area. For area seven, again, hoochies and spoons primarily. Again, you can see the different sizes that were used and the number of encounters associated with each of those combinations. Area nine, we kind of start to see moving to central sound, we see plugs uh, brought into the equation. So now we have hoochies, plugs and spoons used in that area primarily. Again, you can see the variety of sizes associated with each of those gear types and the number of encounters for each of those combinations. Moving farther south in area 10, you can see again, hoochies, plugs and spoons, really similar to area nine. Uh, again, you can see the spread of gear sizes that were used and the numbers associated with them. And then finally down to area 11, kind of the biggest variety of gears that's used uh, throughout the, the region. Um, you can see hoochies, plugs, spoons, and now bait and jigs are used as well. And you can again, see the range of sizes and the number of encounters associated with each of those. And the reason I'm bringing this up is just to kind of show how different all of these areas are, because that's going to come into play in a little while. So moving into the winter samples, we have winter samples in area 10. Again, you could see it's the same kind of uh, slew of gears that are used in the summer. It's hoochies, plugs, and spoons primarily, and you can see all the encounters associated with those. And then moving to area 11, um, kind of a, a more protracted group of uh, gear so types as the summer. So again, hoochies, spoons, and jigs for the, in area 11. Um, and again, you could see the sizes and number of encounters associated with each of those. I will also point out that we did have some winter samples in area nine, um, but there was a really small number and it was really only one gear type and one gear size that had an N of greater than 10. So I will not be talking about area nine um, for the rest of the study, just because there was not a, anything to compare it to. So I couldn't really fit a model to this. So um, for when I compare winter samples, it's just gonna be 10 and 11. So now that I've given you all this information, let's take a look and see what, what this actually resulted in. So here, just to kind of orient to the next couple of slides, here on the x-axis, we're looking at gear types. You can see the, the five most common gears that were used. On the y-axis is the predicted probability of legal-sized fish using each one of those gears. And the spread around that point is the confidence interval around that estimate. The table on the bottom is the actual model results. So for anybody who is into statistics, this is your actual like model parameters that came out of each of these models. And for anything that has a p-value of less than 0.05, that's considered statistically significant. And that will be highlighted in red uh, for the next couple of, of slides. So we can see here that there is a significant difference among gear types in this model. And we again see that spoons have the lowest probability of legal size fish of the gears that we analyzed. <laughs> Um, if we move to gear size, again, now we see sizes on the X axis. And again, probability of catching a legal size fish is on the Y. Again, the point is the, the model predicted value. And then the spread around it is the confidence interval. Again, we have the model table on the bottom. And you can see that the P value is less than 0 0.001. So this is, again, statistically significant difference among the gear types. Um, and I also point out here that there were some gear sizes that were used relatively infrequently. So if we kind of zoom in on the on the gear sizes that were used most often. We can kind of see it's in the middle of this range of gear sizes that we have. And for the rest of the gear sizes, there were relatively infrequent numbers that were used. And again, because I said that we had to eliminate anything that had a combination that was an N of less than 10, uh, these are the gear sizes that we will not see as frequently for the rest of the analysis. And then finally, we wanted to look at catch area. And I, I combined catch area and season on this, but I analyzed them separately. So you'll see in the, the model table, you'll see uh, two different parameters here now. Um, so both catch area and season are highly significant. So on the x-axis now we have catch area, the pink dots are the summer samples and the blue dots are the winter samples. And so we can see a couple things here. Um, the probability of catching illegal sized fish is higher than this in the summer. This should not be a surprise to anybody. We know that bigger fish are moving into the area in the summer. Uh, so that we know that to be a fact. Um, and so we have lower probability of catching winter fish or catching legal size fish in the winter in general. Um, I also like to point out that areas nine and 10 were very similar uh, to each other and it had a similar pattern across seasons. Um, and you can see that the highest probability of catching legal size fish in the study was in area seven. So now we're going to kind of combine this all and look at uh, all of these variables together. And so kind of coming back to this original figure that I had up here where I showed the different uh, gears and sizes around the, the whole study area, um, 
because there's so many differences in the fisheries in each individual area, I modeled all of these, all of the catch areas separately. Um, and I modeled the seasons separately as well. And this just is because um, Fishing techniques tend to be very area specific. We can see here that the, the range of gears changes a lot from moving out from the coast and down into South Sound. Um, so South Sound tends to use more jigs and bait. Um, the Central Sound uses more plugs. And then out in uh, CQ and up in Area 7, it's primarily hoochies and spoons that were used. So because these areas are so different and the techniques that people use in these areas are very different, I just kept them separate in for, uh, for the modeling. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about the summer results. And so here's a really, really big picture um, look at this right now. So again, we have gear type now is on the X axis. Again, the probability of legal size encounters is on the Y. You can see that now the different colors represent the gear size. And so you can see the different sizes that are used kind of throughout the sound. And I'm going to kind of zoom in on each of these areas. Again, the dot is the model predicted probability. And then the spread around it is, again, that confidence interval around that predicted probability. So we can see here, first off, if we just look at this in a big picture format, is that the results are very area specific. There's not a whole lot of pattern between the different areas. And so why is that? Well, there's a number of factors, and I'm kind of going to kind of go into a lot of them in more detail. So it could have something to do with sample size. It could have something to do with the stock composition in all these areas at these different times of year. And again, it could be due to the fishing techniques. So kind of zooming in on all of these areas, first, we're going to start with area five. So there was overall low probability of legal size fish in area five. I will point out that this is the only marine area in the study so far that uh, we had an interaction term modeled because there was balance in the data. So we had multiple gear types that had the same sizes that we can kind of compare it to compare between. Uh, but I also point out here, and you can see the model table that the that interaction term was not significant. So we do, if you're a sucker for p-values and having it be less than 0.05, then this is kind of an insignificant result for, for gear size here. You can see that it's 0.06. So I have it kind of bold and I have a little dot next to it. Um, so this is kind of trending towards being significant. So we think that there might be some um, effective size here, but again, um, it's not totally significant yet, but it just depends on your interpretation of uh, p-values and how much that, you know, how much you're into those. So um, there does be, like I said, there does appear to be some size effects, but we still need to kind of do some more work to kind of really get at that. So for area seven, if we zoom in, um, again, this is the area that had the highest probability of legal size fish throughout the study, but we see that there is no significant difference with gear type or gear size. All the gears that were used in the test fishery had a, an equal chance um, statistically of catching legal size fish. For area nine, we see that there's a significant difference with both gear and size. So you can see now in the, in the chart on the bottom, we have highlighted there that both gear type and gear size are significant and um, having an effect on, catch, on the probability of catching legal size fish. Um, we see that plugs, particularly the large profile plugs, have the highest probability of all the gears that were examined in area nine of catching legal size fish. Um, and spoons had the lowest. I also point out that there's kind of some mixed results here. If you look at spoons, it kind of, you know, smaller spoons are, are higher probability and then it drops down again and then it goes back up and down. So there's kind of some really inconsistent results here that I'll kind of touch on in a little bit. Moving into area 10, we see a really similar pattern again to that of area nine. We see significant differences with both gear type and gear size in area 10. Once again, plugs have the highest probability of catching legal size fish, again, particularly those higher profile plugs, larger sizes, and spoons have the lowest probability of catching legal size fish again. Moving down to area 11, we see that gear type is significant in area 11, but not gear size. And if we look at the gear types that are used here, we can see that plugs and jigs have the highest probability of catching legal size fish in area 11 as compared to the other ones. We see again, spoons are on the lower end there. So moving into the winter results, I have 10 and 11 combined here because these are the only two areas that we had winter results for. So area 10 is on the top and area 11 is on the bottom. And we see that there's overall low probability of legal size fish in winter fisheries, which again is not an unexpected result. Um, so looking at the model results on the table on the bottom, we can see for area 10, both gear type and gear size were significant in predicting the probability of legal size fish in area 10. And in area 11, only gear size now was, um, was significant in predicting the probability of encounters with legal size fish. So we compare area 10 and 11 across seasons because these are the two areas where we have multiple seasons of data for. 
Um, so now area 10 is on the top and area 11 is on the bottom again. And we have summer on the left and winter on the right. We can see that across seasons, um, uh, area 10 large plugs had the highest probability of legal size fish in both seasons. And we see pretty similar patterns between those seasons and area 10. And area 11 is more of a mixed bag. We see very different patterns between seasons. And again, in area 11, um, the, the results of the model were kind of opposite. So the last thing that we did was kind of compared this to some dockside krill data. So in the summer of 2022, we started collecting information dockside about gear selection. And about 20% of anglers were asked dockside um, to give information about the gear that they were using when they were out fishing. So this kind of allowed us to do a little bit of a qualitative comparison about the gear type and size between the test fishing data and the dockside data. So this for this next slide that I'm going to show you, the data is filtered. So it, it, it only includes legal size fish. Obviously, anybody who's coming into the dock should only have legal size fish on their boat. So this is only going to include legal size fish. Um, and I also kind of limited it to only the gear types and sizes that were used in the previous analysis, just so we can have a more direct comparison. And this was simply done to look at trends across the available sampling techniques. So, and this is what this looks like. So now we have gear type on the X axis. We have total length in centimeters on the Y. The pink color now represents dockside samples and the blue represents test fishing samples. And so given that a fish that comes in is legal size, we looked at the range of sizes in the test fishing data as compared to dockside. And all I really want to point out here is that there was really good overlap in the sizes of fish that were caught with each gear type at during each Sea, or during all the fisheries um, in the, or this is, I think this is just summer data. Sorry, this is just summer data. So there's good overlap between uh, the sizes of fish per each gear type in each of the areas between test fishing and dockside sampling. And really what this just does is give us kind of confidence that the data that we're seeing and the trends that we're seeing in the test fishery could be applied to kind of the angling public at large. So kind of just to, to wrap up with some take home messages and looking ahead for this. So really the, the key thing here is that the relationship between Chinook encounters and gear does vary highly spatially and temporally. So there's a lot of differences with seasonality and there's a lot of differences per uh, marine area. So we saw that gear type was a significant factor in the summer in areas nine, 10 and 11. And we saw that it was a significant factor in the winter in area 10. We saw that gear, gear size was significant in the summer in area five, kind of, um, area nine and area 10. So again, area five was where that p-value was 0.06, so kind of borderline. And we saw that gear size was significant in the winter in both areas 10 and 11. So overall, plugs had the highest probability of catching legal size fish, and overall, spoons had the lowest probability of catching legal size fish. So kind of some things to consider as we wrap this up. Area five only has one year of data. There were differences observed in test fishing catch between the open and the closed days during the season. So area five for uh, the majority of July is when we had the kind of alternating every other day uh, fishery happening. And there were differences in the test fishing data that was collected between open days and closed days for the season. In area seven, again, we only had one year of data for um, on gear. And we did, we did see consistently high probability of legal size fish, which could just be due to the ecology of the area, kind of where it sits in the sound. In area nine, we had low sample size in the winter, so that was excluded from the analysis. Um, we saw that the results were less consistent than some of the other areas. So again, there was that really kind of fluctuation, in, especially with spoons, where it was you know higher probability, then it dropped down again, and then it went back up. So it was kind of not really a linear pattern at all. Um, and that could just be due to sample size or could be a location because it, there was a lot of similarities with area 10, uh, but there's also a lot of influence from the Straits and kind of the North Sound there as well. So it could just be kind of there, there's a mixture of things happening there. Area 10, we saw a really similar pattern between seasons. We did see that larger gear uh, increased the probability of legal size in area 10 more than any of the other areas. And then in area 11, we saw a very different pattern between seasons. Um, winter in area 11, as we all know, is in November. So it could just be some differences there, but like with the seasonality, just because kind of by this, when a winter season is open in 11, kind of all the big fish have moved into the rivers. Um, so it just could be different stocks too of the resident fish that are hanging around. So other things I want to point out is that all of these patterns observed may be due to the stock and age structure of the Chinook and the population during any given season. 
some of these stocks that were that are in these areas have exhibited decreases in body size over the last several years, which could be coming into effect here. And as we know, we currently don't have a way to track individual stocks in marine areas. So these are all mixed stock fisheries that we're talking about. And so if there are variations in stock size and age structure that are kind of going into this gear study, we're not really able to track that right now. So that could be something that's really affecting the results of this. So the next steps, um, we're going to continue to collect this data, obviously. Uh, this full data set does include more than 2,000 encounters, as I talked about in the beginning, but there are still some of these gear size area combinations with low sample size. So we want to be able to increase that. We have been expanding test fisheries kind of consistently over the last couple of years. So Area 5 we restarted test fishing in 2022, and this year we're adding 2023, or we added winter, winter fisheries this year in 2023. So we actually have winter fishery or winter test fishing in Area 5 happening right now. Um, in Area 7, we did use two test fishing boats in 2022 to kind of increase the number of samples we were, we were collecting during those short week openers. So again, expanding these test fisheries. Um, there's talk about area adding test fishing in area six this year as well. So we might be able to even get even more samples from out in the straits. Um, and then in central and south sound, we've also expanded test fishing to mostly year round. So we're kind of collecting a lot of samples in, in central and south sound. Um, obviously, with the caveats that there's some downtime for you know staffing issues and uh, boat issues and things like that, things that kind of come up and weather, of course, uh, as well. Um, and then, so the other thing that we want to do is be able to add age to this analysis. As I said, that there could be some um, differences in the age structure within some of the stocks we're looking at. We do take scales in the test fishery, so we will be able to match up uh, scale and age data to each of these encounters that they are associated then with a specific gear type. Um, and so we could potentially examine these patterns within different cohorts and between cohorts um, as we're kind of moving throughout the season. And of course, we want to continue to work with our tribal co-managers on the study because they've been a really big partner in this. So with that, I have a ton of people that I would need to thank, and it would take like another 10 minutes to go through all that. So I will just say high level, uh, Dr. Mickey Aga and Ty Garber have been very instrumental in getting all this data wrangled and helping uh, kind of like solidify the analysis. So I can't thank them enough. Um, I need to thank everybody in the Intergovernmental Salmon Management Unit, most of them who are here today. Uh, the PSSU staff, particularly Ann Stevenson um, and Lyle Jennings, Karen and Sam, who have kind of wrangled all this data and are who are in charge of making sure all the test fishing happens. Uh, the shop leads around the area, Marcus Thompson in the peninsula, Nate Lehman in North Sound, Jeff McKee in Central Sound, and Justin Terry in South Sound. Um, and then our tribal co-managers who have been working with us on this test fishing operations from the Muckleshoot and the Puyallup tribes. Uh, they've been really instrumental in kind of gathering all this data and having really great conversations about um, how we're doing test fishing and making sure that we're all on the same page test fishing out in the sound. Um, and I want to just finally thank all of the WWW and tribal test fishers um, that have been associated with this for collecting all this data. And with that, I'm going to pause here and see if there's any specific questions on, for the gear stuff before we kind of get into the rest of it. And again, we'll kind of alternate between in the room and online. And Carl, if you want to just come up to the mic, then you can ask your first question. Yeah, well, first of all, um, you know, I really wanted to uh, thank the department and the co-managers for getting this program and this study um, underway and, and really comprehensively, you know, for Kirsten putting this together and putting together this pr presentation. I've been interested in gear study for managing these um, sublegal Chinook encounters for some time. And, you know, there, there are several reasons why this is important. This shows that the department is committed to finding alternative methods for allowing access to the resource for the recreational anglers of their constituents, the, the citizens of Washington state. Um, you know, and I would love to see something similar with uh, catch and release fishing, perhaps not as comprehensive, but you know, some type of study that shows the uh, ability to release fish effectively and safely and the reduction in fishing effort when we have catch and release fisheries that are conducted in marine waters, because that may be another tool that will be critical to the future of recreational angling in Puget Sound 
when we get into critical status of Chinook fishing. Um, so from this presentation, it, it's pretty obvious that these tools are most important when we have a high abundance of sublegal fish. So, uh, you know, as you're already considering, I'm sure it's important to consider education uh, in a very simplified manner as perhaps a paper handout and a digital outreach for folks that do fish these areas in the winter, like area 10 and 11, so uh, that folks can understand things that, you know, a lot of uh, highliners and charters have already been doing for years. Uh, you get into a fishery where you start to encounter a lot of sublegal fish and we take off our spoons and we put on a plug, even a, even a hoochie will reduce the number of sublegal encounters. Uh, something that was I did not see in this presentation was the frequency of encounters, you know, over time period. So one of the reasons that folks use spoons is because they will get more bites over a certain period of time. So this is why, you know, it's very important, you know, obviously you're not looking into making any gear regulation anytime soon in a marine water. But um, you want to realize that, you know, if you get into a body of water where there are a lot of legal fish, you know, folks are going to want to use spoons because they're going to get bites faster. So, um, you know, we obviously don't want to jump up and down saying, you know, let's make gear restrictions in area seven because, you know, that's going to be the fastest way to get a bite. And there's a lot of legal fish down there. And we want folks to be able to catch them. So just something that you know folks are going to be concerned about when they hear these this type of talk and and obviously that's not your concern that's not your goal is to go out and make a bunch of rules right away but this is great data and i uh, i really appreciate you guys putting this, this together and i look forward to seeing this program continue thank you very much thanks carl i appreciate that it looks like we have a hand up from zach online zachary go ahead all right, can y'all hear me? Hear me okay? Yep, yep, we can hear you. Thank you. So, um, from a management standpoint, it seems like jigs and plugs are potentially sort of standout options for, you know, any this goal of expanding opportunity by reducing sub sublegal encounters in the Central Sound area. Uh, so, I'm just curious: are jigs deployed by test fishing boats in Marine Area 10, um, such that hopefully, you know, with continued data collection, the sample size will grow? Or is it that the current understanding is that jigs are not used sufficiently by anglers in Marine Area 10 to justify the test fishing boats using them? So uh, that's a good question. They are used by the test fishers. And again, um, the test fishing vessels are mimicking what's happening in the fleet. And that's one of the reasons that we started collecting more dockside data on gear choices by the angling public. So it could be that, you know, if jigs are used, you know, 10% of the time in area 10 in the summer, then the test fishers will try to employ jigs 10% of their test fishing time uh, during that same time period. So I did say that um, there were some combinations of gear and sizes that were eliminated from the analysis because there was low sample size. And I believe that was one that, that kind of didn't make the cut. So I did have jig data from area 10, but there wasn't enough samples to kind of add it to the analysis. Um, and again, this is one of the reasons that we wanna continue this study on for the next several years is to really kind of grow the number of sample sizes for those specific combinations that we wanna have more data on. Um, especially because jigs are used so often in South Sound. You know, all these things are really specific as to who fishes with what in what areas. And so we really wanted to be able to capture that. Um, and so if there are more, more anglers that are using jigs in area 10, that will show up in the test fishing and then it'll eventually show up in the data source. So. Yeah, awesome, perfect. That's, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, obviously the first things you need to keep the test fishing methodology sound. So it sounds like that is going well. And I, cause it, it definitely does seem like that any sort of like incentivizing the public or whatever, the whole jigs and plugs is definitely a strong, the strongest looking contender for those central sound problem areas. Thanks, Zach. And I saw Art has a question. You want to come up to the mic, Art? Good afternoon and uh, nice job on that, really. That was pretty good. Thank you. Um, 
My question is, um, it, it seems like there's quite an emphasis in areas 10 and 11. Was there a reason for that or just only had so many test fishermen or we have we just have more test fishing that's done in area 10 and 11 right so there's pretty much year-round test fishing happening in area 10 right now we've had the most consistent winter fisheries in area 10 so we have more winter test fishing in area 10 uh, we just have more data for those areas uh, you know we just added area five back in last year and this is this is right now is the first time we're having winter test fisheries in area five so we are collecting that data we just don't have very much of it right now um, and then area seven, we had data from last year that had uh, that had gear associated with it. But um, yeah, it's more of just the number of, da of data points that we have from those areas. So why is there more data coming out of those two areas than other areas? Well, I think what I would say, Art, is because that's where we've had the most resources to put at test fishing and assessment you know, compared to the seasons that we have. We've had shorter seasons in seven. We haven't had test fishing in the Straits for a long time. We've re-implemented test boats up there starting last year in five. This year, we're going to have a test boat back in area six, where we haven't been, I think, since the late 2000s uh, conducting test fishing. Uh, again, same thing in nine. We haven't had winter test fisheries, so we haven't been in nine in the winter very much. Every once in a while, the Area 10 boat will sneak up there and, and do a little sampling, but it's really tied to the seasons that we've had. And, you know, these test fisheries are si tied to the in-season management and assessments that we do. So it made sense that, that that's where we concentrated this to start. Thank you to the legislature last year. We were able to get more resources towards this. We've got some more boats coming online in Puget Sound this year for the sampling and monitoring program, as well as additional test fishing positions. Uh, that we're hiring to be on more time through the year. So that's where we're actually expanding the amount of time that we're test fishing and the number of areas um, to be able to get at some of this information. All right, thank you. I saw one other hand, Gabe. Leah, anybody else with a hand up online? Nobody else online. And just to remind folks, uh, star nine to raise your hand. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I believe you alluded to it uh, a couple questions ago, but are we going to continue collecting test fishing data or collecting gear study data from the test boats going forward? Yes, we are. It is now like standard part of the, the data collection. So each encounter has all the slew of information that they normally do, plus gear method, gear type, gear size, everything like that. So we're going to, that's going to continue on as far as I know, that's our intention is to keep it going, you know, as long as we can. Definitely. Okay. Um, and I saw that we're only asking 20% of the people that are creel checked, you know, what gear they're fishing with. There's a reason not to ask 100% of them. So, um, uh, you go ahead. <laughs> um, anybody who's been creeled by our staff uh, sometimes feels like those interviews already take forever. And I think we felt like uh, the way we were approaching it with a... a because we're collecting it electronically, we have the ability to kind of uh, randomly assign those questions to samplers throughout the day. And we felt like that was an adequate enough sample size to get a good representation for each area um, uh, without having to burden that upon every angler in every interview. Okay. Um, I, it might be helpful to add the uh, gear data to the VTR reports too. Um, because if anybody's spending the time to do a VTR report, they probably don't have a problem putting what gear they're using. Yeah, thanks. So that's a really good suggestion. We've actually thought about that a little bit too. So I can uh, work with the sampling unit. I know Ann's in the back now. So Ann and I can circle up and have a conversation about potentially getting that added on. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really good idea. And it would help us in areas where we don't have test fishing too, where you can start collecting some of that. So yeah. Anyways, thank you. Thanks, Gabe. So Chad, if you want to go ahead and get the other presentation up online, um, really appreciate Kirsten running through that and, and uh, the thoughtful questions here. As we said, we're going to continue this study into the future. We haven't quite put an end date on it yet, um, but uh, really excited to, to kind of uh, move forward and see what kind of differences we see as, as time goes on in the future. So uh, realizing that we took up a good half hour there, a little more uh, on this subject, and, and folks are here to talk about fisheries this year, we're really going to uh, uh, go right through this pretty quick. Um, and I did want to mention that maybe I haven't mentioned before, for those folks online, 
everything you're seeing here uh, is available on our website. Uh, we're going to go through some modeling tools here really shortly with our modeling staff looking at fisheries this year, different exploitation rates. All those modeling tools are available for you to download online and be able to look at uh, while we're going through stuff here. So just wanted to make sure I mentioned that to folks. So go ahead and uh, cycle through here, Chad, and I'm going to, with Kirsten's indulgence, I'll just maybe... It's sensitive technology, you know. So uh, the first part of our presentation today, uh, really talking about the staff that's here, um, so so you have a good idea. Um, the other part of the the recreational breakout was really just a, a, a another glance at our forecast for this year. Uh, again, those are available up on our website. Um, I think, uh, as we stated before, um, uh, the the really the key um, Chinook forecasts that are really going to be driving our stocks this year are um, the Stilaguamish, uh, as in years past, uh, as well as uh, Skagit Summer Falls. Uh, we're going to be paying attention to Snohomish and Nisqually as well for Chinook. Um, on the Coho side, uh, and you heard Angelica allude to it earlier, it's really the, the Skagit Coho stock that's, that's in a lower management tier this year uh, is going to be the driver for our fisheries uh, within the, the marine waters this year. Uh, and then the again the the Thompson coho stock uh, to a 10% exploitation on Thompson through the southern U.S. fisheries uh, are going to be the driver stocks there. Try hitting enter. There we go. Keep going. Thank you. It took a second, man. Yeah. So, Chad, I think we're just going to roll through these. So, go ahead and hit enter again. Keep Thank going. Um, again, uh, Chinook forecast. We, like I said, we went through these a little bit. Still, the Guamish is up pretty significantly, but it's not. It's it's within the same management objectives as last year. Um, spring forecasts here, not really affecting Puget Sound fisheries very much. Go ahead. Um, these are hatchery forecasts. So as, as we stated earlier, they're up uh, a little bit over last year. Hatchery spring stocks, again, keep going. Uh, coho forecasts, uh, the natural forecasts are up a little bit over last year. And then hatchery forecasts are also up 1.16 over last year. In total, I think it's close to 100,000 more coho uh, this year to Puget Sound. Obviously, this is a pink year this year. That's going to factor into a lot of our discussions today. Um, this year's forecast, 3.9, uh, a little bit over a million, but pretty close uh, uh, compared to 21, but pretty close to what returned in 21 for a forecast this year. So as I said, the recreational considerations this year are about Chinook conservation, uh, maximizing the fishing opportunity within the available uh, impacts. Uh, we've seen some recent year variability in the effort in our fisheries. We've seen increased uh, effort above the averages in a number of areas. So that's a consideration as we're crafting opportunities. And then in most areas, pink salmon will just be part of the uh, daily limit this year. We may have some exceptions in certain areas, just depending on what those forecasts are. Um, freshwater fisheries, it looks like uh, for most uh, places and areas, uh, the seasons are planned to be pretty similar to what they were in 2022. We are looking at some potential changes, both on the quill scene and the Samish uh, for a variety of different reasons, and we'll be getting deeper into those next week at our at our public meetings and through the rest of this process. And with that quick kind of summation, I am going to hand the mic and the computer over to Ty Garber to start us off with some uh, coho 
discussion. Uh, they put together a modeling tool that helps us look at different uh, scenarios for fisheries and how that affects our exploitation rates towards coho for this year. So go ahead, Ty. For those of you online, it'll take us a minute here to do a, a computer swap over and get the modeling tool up for everybody to see. So bear with us. Anybody on the Zoom can see? Can you see him? I can see him. Perfect. Good. Hi, I'm Ty Garber. I was uh, the Mark Selective Fishery Biologist dealing with Puget Sound estimates uh, for a number of years. I recently transitioned to a Coho modeling job, um, working with Derek and Angelica. Um, this tool, um, which is available online, uh, is directly inspired by the uh, a tool Derek puts out every year for analyzing expectation rates um, in comparison to the objective in different scenarios. Um, so I'll just go through it real quick. Um, so we're looking at the Skagit wild stock, the Steely wild stock, the Snohomis wild stock, the Hood Canal wild, JDF and Thompson or interior Frazier. Um, each one of these uh, rows in here is a different scenario with Mark MSF representing Mark selective, um, NS representing non-selective, uh, uh, WE representing weekend days, and then WD representing weekday days. Um, so the way it works is you go in, and this is a non-additive model, meaning it's based off of one run, the changes to one run, and that's the mid-ocean option. So as you go through this, um, this tool, it'll only take an X for one scenario for each area. And as it moves around, um, I'll just move this one. It'll update automatically. So if I put an X right here, you can see these are the outputs right here. And if they go over, it'll turn red for any of these, these stocks. So the first one um, is pretty much um, going as is um, in area five from July 1st to September 30th, uh, just mark selective. Um, the second one is July 1st through September 17th, mark selective, and then six days of uh, non-selective retention uh, or ID, I labeled them with the letters, um, is adding a weekday to the previous one. Um, and this adding two weekdays, weekdays to, to the one above that of non-selective fishing. Area six, the first one is kind of as it was last year, adding six days, then adding six days of non-selective um, fishing, and then six days and one weekend, weekday, of non-selective and then six weekend and then two weekday of non-selective. Area seven, uh, the first one is modeled uh, non-selective August 16th through September 30th with a one fish limit. 
Um, the, the second one is uh, mark selective August with a two coho limit and then changing to non-selective the first through the 17th of September with one coho limit. Um, uh, model J is uh, mark selective all of August, the two fish limit or, or two fish limit pink or hatchery coho and a non-selective uh, with the one 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 fish bag limit, um, model number AA is non-selective in uh, area seven, August first through September seventeenth. The two fish limit, one of a, one of them being coho, uh, either marked or unmarked. AB is area seven, August first through September thirtieth. The two fish limit with one being coho marker marked or unmarked. Then area A1, um, it's modeled kind of how it was last year. I, I think it's down a few days. Um, this one, uh, due to a kind of change in the modeling, how we do the inputs is uh, just right off the bat, savings on uh, Skagit, um, fisheries right in front of the river. Um, but that's just kind of a, a free savings um, due to the, the, the way we modeled this, this fishery or the input model the fish, input fisheries. Um, Area A2, modeling August 18th through 31st and September 1st through 21st, um, non-selective with a uh, two salmon limit, one of them can be in coho. Um, and then just shifting around the days here, um, taking out four days, um four weekdays and then august 18th through 31st and september 1st through 30th doing two salmon bag limit one of them could be coho august 31st and september 1st through 30th non-selective again uh two bag limit one of them could be coho and then area A2, August 11th through September 17th, two fish will be coho. And then these are both non-selective. Um, then uh, August 11th through September 30th. And then for area nine, modeling August 1st through September 30th, mark selective. And then the 18th through 30th of September being non-selective. So 13 days of non-selective fishing. August 1st um, through September 30th, mark selective basically as it, as it is now, uh, or as it was last year. Um, then August 1st through September 21st, mark selective, and then switching to non-selective the 22nd through 30th. And then this is adding uh, October 1st through 8th, a non-selective fishery in area nine with a one coho limit. And this is just uh, kind of needs to be checked. This is updating the numbers coming or the new modeling uh, input method to, to put into this model. So does anybody have any questions? Gabe? Thanks. So on the on Skagit, um, it's my understanding that over 30% of that Skagit number is in river harvest. Is that correct? Terminal fisheries and in river. What percentage of that is recreational fishing? Um, 20, 25%. Perhaps. Okay. And uh, do we know what the mark rate is going to be in the Skagit this year? If we looked it up, we knew it. Just a sec. I, I think okay. Andrew might be online. He he might be able to answer what that predicted mark rate is for this year. Well, I, I think you know where I'm going with this. Is there opportunity for some mark select in the river, if need be, that could help alleviate some of this? And so, uh, 
maybe I'll just share uh, what my thoughts are around uh, inside outside sharing. Um, I think if we're looking at targets kind of for marine area fisheries, I would like to see uh, our marine area exploitation be about what it was last year on Skagit. Um, I know that um, uh, there's considerations for in-river fisheries. I talked to Andrew this morning actually about it. He's our biologist for the Skagit. Um, uh, he does have some ideas for, for Mark Selective Opportunity. And um, I think we're we're ready to jump in those discussions with our co-managers uh, about what that that package looks like once we get some initial modeling put in. There, it, it, obviously, it depends on what the mark rate is, time and place, and all that. We we don't want to try to prosecute a mark selective fishery on a low mark rate, but if if there's a period in there that could help everybody out to do that, especially when we have Chinook in the river, if we have a low water year, there probably some savings for Chinook too. So. My my recollection, Gabe, is that there's about 80,000 fish due to come back to Marble Mount this year. Uh, for some reason, that number sticks out in my mind. So I think we are uh, we have that ability within River to be able to manage that, and we have monitoring resources. I think we're also hopeful that maybe the, the in-season update gives us a little better uh, news once we have that information and we can think about expanding River opportunity too. Okay, thank you. Looks like about 70% mark rate. Yeah, Alex, before you get started, we'll just check and see with, for, with Leah and see if there's any questions online. I was just going to say that Zach has his hand up again. Zachary, go ahead. Thanks, I'll just, uh, I, most of my question was answered by that. So that's sort of really helpful really helpful. I'm really glad we have this uh, tool for Coho this year. That's, you know, I loved using it for the, you know, the Kings in previous years, and this is super helpful for the Coho. So thank you guys a lot for putting this together. And just to sort of make sure I'm on the, on the, on the same, or I, I have the correct assumption based on the previous comments. So my goal in looking at this tool should roughly be to get the difference in the Skagit wild exploitation to 0% that that's sort of the approximate ceiling um, when I'm sort of looking at these different options that I should be looking at. And that would be in line with what Mark said about keeping the exploitation rate the same as it was, the or the marine area exploitation rate around the same as it was last year. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's all a moving target at this point. And so I think that just that I would use that as a general guidance um, you know, we're we're really just looking at at where we can where we can maximize the healthy stocks and and take care of the weakest stocks. And so that was just kind of a general target that I was thinking of as I was looking through this. Yep, appreciate that. I'm not mean to hold you to any hold you to that. So thank you. Okay, Alex, uh, is the ten percent ER objective for the Thompson River is that the same as last year? When did that number go into effect? Has that always been the number? It's been part of the Pacific Salmon Treaty, at least for the last two times that we've had the treaty in place. And okay. I would say 2019, we, even before that. And I would say it's just it's one of those that's chronically low. I don't think it may be one year then since I've been a part of it. It's been out of the low status. And we exceeded that 10 percent you mentioned before in 2019 and 2020. I believe so. You the, So remember, that's not just. Washington, that's southern U.S. fisheries exceeded that that ten percent. Sus is below the northern fisheries, though. Correct. Right? Yeah, so that would be. Oh, so you're saying Oregon as well? Well, uh, wherever those fish are caught in the ocean or Puget Sound, that's not Canadian waters. Correct. Okay. Um, on the Area Seven proposals, where did the date of September seventeenth come from? Is that uh, just really just looking at a calendar, and I think that gets us through one of the weekends through Sunday. So it was just trying to look at a calendar and see what made the most sense for uh, a cutoff day uh, to try to, um, you know, keep us within our limits, I guess, so to speak. Oh, so it was an effort to reduce our our exploitation rates because traditionally we would always see that season go through September 30th. Correct, but uh, you know, last year I know uh, there was a lot of uh, dissatisfaction with having it be a mark selective fishery through yeah. the month of September. So. Uh, with all this, if we're going to go non-selective, there just needs to be compromises. And that was, you know, 
one of the compromises was less days to fish non-selectively. I mean, I'm, I'm biased. My birthday's on the 26th, so I, I want that. <laughs> uh, but I also don't see any options uh, for a two coho limit on there, even as a mark selective. And we can consider it again. It's always I, been I, an option. Yeah, it's 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 totally an option. I guess, uh, again, thinking about the non-selective piece and trying to keep those impacts down, that's where we were thinking about a two salmon, you know, one coho, because then there's still be pink opportunity there to to go after those as well. Okay, and then so to kind of circle back on the Thompson, we got 10% expectation rate. We exceeded that in 2019, 2020. Um, and... So, so why are we going, or I guess at what point would we consider not going mark selective on that fishery in area seven? Well, it's it's really just a matter of uh, sharing between the ocean fisheries and the, the rest of the package within Puget Sound and, and, you know, what we can land on that keeps us at or below the 10%. But historically, you said we, we went beyond that in 2019 and 2020, correct? In the postseason analysis, okay. in the preseason, we were forecasted to be below. below. Okay. Yeah. And all right. That's, that's good enough. Thank you. Yep. And it looks like we have a question in the chat from Ryan. Ryan, if you want to go ahead and ask your question live, you can do so now. Yeah, I was wondering if you guys could speak a little bit about the effect of the 2021 floods on the Skagit and Nooksack returns. It looks like the uh, pink salmon in the Nooksack have been pretty much decimated and uh, definitely down on the Skagit as well. Lee, I wonder if Andrew's online and might be able to address that. Yes, he is. I am unmuting him now. Hey there. 2021 floods were were indeed pretty devastating. Um, it appears the biggest hit was to our summer fall Chinook, the spot on the main stem in the Skagit. Um, the outmigration at the small trap was the lowest on record. Our pinks um in this gadget they did take a hit and the small trap data wasn't very good but we did have some better data uh, from marine surveys out in front so not a, a great picture but um, not total devastation in the nook sack they took that flood a lot harder than we did um, that that system actually hit the upper gadget above the dams and then the trajectory went up into the Nooksack and Fraser, and um, as you probably saw in the news, Nooksack was kind of a mess. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Guy for uh, putting this together, uh, this tool for coho fishing. And I, I did just want to, uh, I, I put in some uh, proposals to the department already, and so I won't go over that, but focusing on coho and the use of this tool, uh, we did have some discussion at a meeting uh, yesterday uh, about a uh, what I thought was a pretty good alternative that was presented by one of the uh, one of my fellow advisors for Puget Sound Sport Fisheries, Brandon Mason, and that was the idea of having non-selective fishing in October. So I think the the uh, simplest way to put that, and I, I couldn't see very well; it's so yeah. small, and I, I know you, there's nothing you can do about that. But I didn't know if you had you probably didn't have the time to look at that yet. But I think it would be an interesting uh, uh, analysis just to compare if there is some additional fishing in October that is non-selective compared to the non-selective fishery of of the months or the period of August 15th through September 30th. So just simply adding a certain amount of non-selective time in October, perhaps it's one week, two weeks, maybe the month, 
just to see what the kinds of costs to Thompson impacts are. I think that would be uh, potentially a viable option to consider. And uh, I, I think not just with area five, though it came from Brandon from area five, it also seems like it might be a viable alternative in area six and seven as well. Uh, of course, uh, having three areas with that, it's gonna be more costly than having it in one area, still having it broken out by area just to see. And that's the reason for uh, looking at perhaps not just the entire month of October, but some period, a shorter period of time than the full month. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. And maybe my only comment there was uh, another consideration for those time periods and fisheries would be Chinook non-retention and what those impacts are for those fisheries that we'd have to keep an eye on. Yeah, I have some time to, to add the October um, to this tool, but it, it's on my list and we'll do that. And th this tool will get better as we have more data coming to it and it'll be more useful. Uh, further along. Looks like um, we have one hand online and then I see Carl will be next in the room. Our next hand is from Kyle. Kyle, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, just a quick question on how um, we expect uh, the pink forecast to impact um, our seasons, catch rates, et cetera. And do we model that? Um, just thinking through uh, you know, if if you have bag limits that are, you know, two salmon, um, but pink, there's no bonus or whatever the bag limit is, but there's no bonus pink limit. Some, you know, some folks will get off the, get their pinks and get off the water. And if that has a net, uh, have we seen that have a net benefit to um, Chinook coho seasons? And do, how do we model that? Thank you. So I, I think we don't really factor that into our modeling. Uh, I think what we try to pay attention to is um, what systems have a harvestable surplus of pinks on them and which ones are, you know, right near the escapement goal or below. Um, and so just like with a lot of our salmon stocks, there's a lot of variability throughout Puget Sound about um, how uh, far above that uh, escapement goal number we are or, or, you know, at or below that. So I'm thinking, you know, still a Guamish is, is somewhat of a low pink forecast, but yet it's pretty healthy in the Snohomish, which is right next door. Um, similarly in South Sound, I think the, the, the green number is really good. Um, the Puyallup number is not so good, and the Nisqually number is really good. So it's one of those where we're going to have to balance those opportunities uh, in the pre-terminal marine area with uh, also trying to pay attention to, to what that impact might be uh, for those systems that aren't necessarily expecting a robust pink return. Well, I'm more asking, though, um, around like, okay, take, you know, something like Area 9 or Area 10, you know, does the existence of pinks um, result in, you know, fewer impacts on Chinook and Coho um, because you got to get through the pinks to get to the Chinook and Coho and some people get their two pinks or whatever and get off the water. Does that make sense? It does. I'm not, I, you know, uh, I'm kind of looking at our modeling staff here. I don't really necessarily think that it factors into our modeling uh, other than we would catch that variation in pink years. Uh, as we use the data that we collect in each given year to inform kind of the 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 next year or you know the following pink years uh, um, modeling inputs, but I don't know if Derek or Ty. At least as far as uh, Chinook goes, it's it's been a few years since I looked at this. I have to confess, but I was kind of curious about the potential of this effect too. So at least as far as Chinook goes, and in some of the South Sound areas where I was looking, um, uh, what what I kind of noticed was that uh, that we don't really see a reduction in in catch of Chinook during the pink years. Uh, it tends to be, uh, and I I don't know exactly what the effect could be there. Uh, it could be possible that even though uh, uh, maybe folks are using pinks to fill that bag limit, it could be possible that maybe there's greater effort in pink years. But once again, I wasn't necessarily seeing uh, that that effect that one uh, well, one might expect to see given kind of the logic that you'd outlined 
I don't know if Ty has any more comments on Coho. Um, no, I don't. Um, just logically, it, it, it makes sense that someone, a fisherman's going to prioritize uh, Chinook or Coho over a pink. So if you have X amount of slots for salmon to, to, to use up, you're going to be using those with Chinook or Coho anyway. So I wouldn't expect a, a, a big um, difference between pink years. Okay, thanks. Carl? Yeah, I just want to say I was happy to see in Ty's tool there, um, you know, lines 37 and 39, uh, you know, with an option for some non-selective coho time in Marine Area 9. You know, now that we're out of the rebuilding status in the Snohomish, I, I understand we do have the Skagit concerns and, and you know, until we get all the pieces and see how much that is in river and what the trade-offs are, I, and I, you know, honestly haven't had a time to really sit down with the tool and, and you know, look at the trade-offs until we get a, a true understanding of what our inputs are in the model and, and you know, where we're at with all our fisheries proposals, but, um, you know, just making the point that the last two years with Area 9 being a marked selective coho fishery in August and all of September, while Area 10 was non-selective, just a tremendous loading of fishing pressure on the northern boundary of Marine Area 10. I, I don't know what that does to the, you know, the escapement and the harvest between, you know, area nine rivers and area and, and rivers in the south sound, further south sound, but um, that's got to skew some of the predicted escapements uh, compared to what you guys predict. And, and it certainly makes for some crowded fishing there. So, you know, I, I just would really like to, uh, you know, put a plug in for some of that non-selective time and, and and I look forward to North Falcon 2 and PFMC and and working to see if we can get some of that non-selective time in for coho in marine area nine. Uh that that was my only comment on this sheet here for now. Thank you. Folks maybe want to turn it over and talk about Chinook a little bit. I know Derek's put together some uh, a number of things for us to consider as far as Chinook modeling and Chinook seasons go. I think we'll try to get that up on the, the screen. Leah, is there any other coho questions online? There are not. Are they seeing it online? Paul, do you have the zoom up? Are they seeing the tool online? All good, brother. All right. So, um, this tool is very similar to the one that um, Ty had presented, um, but maybe just a very quick run through of what we're looking at here because there are a, a few slight differences. So kind of um, folks might um, recognize this from what we've presented in the past, um, but what we have here on screen is uh, kind of in our first column, our column A, um, we're looking at potential actions that we could take. And then in column B, what we could do is we could put an X in these boxes to signify those actions. As we kind of take actions in this modeling tool, we see that over here, we have kind of the starting exploitation rates and objectives from the current modeling run outputs that's in this row that I'm highlighting on screen right now. 
Uh, we see just above that, the management objective for what each of those uh, metrics that we're looking at are. Um, and then following that, as we start to put X's in boxes, we can see how, it, how taking that action would potentially change the exploitation rate in this row right here. Appreciate that. So um, as we're going through this tool, just as an example, um, we could, for example, um, uh, check uh, this box right here. Um, and this box signifies changing to one of the other ocean options. Right now, the tool itself is built off the middle ocean option. So if we say change to the high ocean option, we can see kind of the effect that has on each of these metrics. We see, for example, the Stiligwamish non-treaty uh, marked SUS rate go up by about 0.1. We see the Snohomish uh, uh, SUS rate go up by about 0.4. And that's kind of um, what we're looking at as we're walking through this tool. There are kind of a number of stocks and metrics that we're looking at, at across the top here. And actually, maybe let me zoom out a little bit to try to see if I can get them all on screen at once. There we go. And let me try to move this. Um, so um, as we kind of had discussed a few times now, still Guamish is likely to be one of our primary constraining stocks. Um, what we're really looking to do for Stiligwamish um, is uh, target a certain number of non-treaty mortalities, that is, uh, mortalities that occur in, in the uh, non-tribal fisheries. Uh, there's always a little bit of wiggle room on exactly what that target is, especially as in the model we haven't updated Canadian fisheries and abundances just yet. So um, we don't have a concrete, this is the number of mortalities that we'll need by the very end of the process. Uh, what I can say right now in the current modeling, that number of mortalities is coming out just over 90. It's at about 90.5 is where we'd like to be. So um, in terms of kind of these starting model runs, the primary target that I think I'd like to have us target is probably um, around 100 mortalities in the non-treaty fisheries. That is a little bit more than is currently available, but keeping in mind that there's these moving pieces such as the Canadian fisheries and abundances, maybe that's a, a good place to be in the starting model run. Um, just very quickly, kind of across the top, some of the other metrics that we might be looking at. We mentioned that these three stocks are ones that are likely to be exceeding their management objectives, Snohomish, Nisqually, and Skagit Summer Falls. So even though primarily in this tool, we'll be talking about and thinking about Stiligwamish, we, as we kind of take these actions, we can look and see how these secondary and, uh, and, and tertiary stocks are affected as well. Um, I do have to confess that kind of from the forecast meeting and talking about this tool development, I, I have, and when we start going through the scenarios, hopefully folks will recognize this, I have been trying to take kind of feedback that I've been hearing in some of the public meetings about what the right things to put in the tools are. Um, I think that there was in the forecast meeting, there was a comment about putting uh, kind of angler trips in as a metric that we're paying attention to in this tool. Um, I had hoped to do that, but unfortunately, as time ran out, um, what I did maybe as a secondary measure to look at is the total marine Puget Sound sport catch. So that'll be some metric of, of kind of gauging how the quotas in our fisheries overall are changing as we take some of these actions. So um, kind of... Um, if there's not any questions about that, maybe I can start describing some of the scenarios and maybe a good place to start is uh, up here. So um, I have highlighted, I call these ones the pre-run actions. And in these pre-run actions, these are actions that are kind of imminent and will be updated in the next set of model runs. These are the standard things that we do in our modeling process, uh, updating kind of the sublegal legal ratios for our fisheries, uh, updating the non-retention encounter estimates to reflect this year's abundances, um, and then, um, and then, of course, updating the non-treaty terminal area fisheries as well as the tribal fisheries in the modeling. So, kind of, if folks are looking at this tool and kind of playing along online, what you could do is you could. What, what I would recommend is just putting an X in these three boxes to start with, um, because, as I mentioned, those ones are ones that are imminent and that we will expect kind of in the next set of model runs. Um, as we continue looking down and going down the options, um, uh, I did want to once again highlight that um, uh, this is built off the middle ocean option run. If you did want to look at, say, either the high or the low, low ocean option, we could check these boxes right here. For at the moment, we'll just keep it on the middle ocean option run. So moving into some of the Puget Sound sport scenarios, um, we do have it divided out by area and time period. And uh, for the tool, as you're scrolling through, what you might notice is it's, it's basically just... Uh, in numerical order, area five, six, seven, eight, nine, et cetera. 
Um, and um, kind of as we're looking at that, um, there were kind of a few considerations as we were going into the modeling this year. First of all, I wanted to describe that there's kind of uh, two different modeling methods that I tend to use for coming up with Puget Sound sport inputs uh, for the year, the developing the quotas. And uh, one of those is very complex, but has been kind of described before in previous years. Uh, it's an effort based approach where we're developing kind of uh, an estimated effort in the fishery, and that's applying to the abundances that we see in the, the current model run, in this case, the 2023 model run. And based off kind of a, a combined um, abundance of stocks that are uh, present in certain fisheries and uh, an effort, then we can come up with what we expect a quota to be. Um, and historically, we've used this for a lot of our areas and time periods. Um, um, I would mention that kind of as we develop the, uh, as we develop those efforts, there is, um, it, it does require kind of what we call our post-season fram model runs. So it does require running our model with, pre, with estimates of what occurred in previous years, both in terms of fisheries and abundance. Um, and there is a little bit of a lag on getting that data. So, um, so as we run kind of these effort calculations, we're using recent year efforts, but there is a few year lag usually to, to, to get that fully updated. And the reason why I mentioned that is because there's another methodology that we use. We call it a catch per day methodology, and it's very simplistic. In that methodology, what we do is we look at the time that a fishery and time period was open, and uh, we calculate kind of how many Chinook are caught per day. And using kind of um, a recent year average of Chinook caught per day, then we kind of apply that simply to the number of days open and, and can estimate what a quota might look like under that metric. So the, the reason why I'm taking such time to describe kind of our two different modeling methods is uh, this year is really unique um, in that um, oftentimes those methods produce similar estimates of catch. Um, but um, last year, particularly uh, 2022 in the summer, or if you look back at 2021 to 2022 in the winter, we really saw um, a great increase in catch per day across a lot of our marine areas and fisheries. And so um, when we update that and, and use that new catch per day information, um, when we use kind of that catch per day methodology then to um, update our modeling and our quotas necessary for this year, we do see uh, quite a large increase in the quotas that would be ne necessary to, to have those fisheries. Um, so, um, so anyway, that, that, that's what we're seeing is uh, kind of a pretty big increase in, in that catch per day in 2022. So um, one thing that we're not 100% sure on is, was that kind of an anomaly that we witnessed just in 2022? And by using that catch per day methodology, are we overestimating the, the catch quotas that we would need? Um, or was that part of a long-term trend? Because we have seen in a lot of our areas that catch per day increasing, although maybe not to the same rate that we saw in 2022. So um, it's really important as we're kind of gaming out um, different scenarios for these areas, which method is applied. Um, and in uh, kind of the, the, the story here is that um, um, if we were to model many of our areas and time periods uh, using the catch per day, that might be, um, uh, if we are seeing an increase in that metric, um, that might be kind of uh, a way to preserve seasons and ensure that, that, they are, uh, that, that they aren't cut short quite as quickly. However, if we think that that 2022 um, catch per day that we saw was uh, anomalous, then, then it might be more appropriate to use the effort-based method. And it does matter because as we use that catch per day method and have higher impacts, that of course has higher impacts on Stiligwamish and the stocks of concern that we're looking at in the modeling. So as we walk through kind of the scenarios for each marine area, I do look um, uh, at both methods, uh, the effort and the catch per day method. Um, and uh, in general, once again, that catch per day method is a substantial impact increase. Um, but, um, but also kind of as we're going through this exercise, I considered thinking about um, ways in which um, we might also have scenarios that reduce our impacts uh, on Stiligwamish and of the stocks of concern. So as I've been thinking about that kind of across the marine areas, I tried to implement um, first of all, um, in, in many areas, I tried to look at a scenario where we uh, uh, overlapped the um, Chinook and Coho fisheries uh, more, such that um, such that there would be less uh, non-retention modeled for Coho, and that that potentially creating Chinook savings. I know that's the scenario that we explored last year. That wasn't a very popular one, but I did want to put it on here as a potential option to reduce. Um, uh, to, to reduce exploitation rates. Um, in other situations, I looked at kind of seasonal closures 
and what kind of benefit we might get there. Um, and so the reason why it's important to look at those scenarios is um, I'm also trying to look at some of the scenarios that we'd heard um, in the forecast meeting. And particularly, um, I think one of the things that, we th that, that we'd heard was um, looking at kind of um, across a wide range of marine areas, um, how could we get, uh, how, how could we carve out a small amount of time of fishing in the winter? And the scenario that I've looked at um, kind of in this tool is looking at kind of a 15 day winter fishery across all areas. And as we look at those winter fisheries, we can see kind of what the impacts would be if we start putting X's in boxes for those. And as it turns out, some of them tend to be um, quite expensive on still Guamish mortalities and potentially on other, some of our other stocks of concern. So if we were to look at a scenario such as that one, we would need to find ways in other areas to then reduce our impacts to get to um, a package that meets kind of that 100 Stiligwamish mortalities target. Um, in addition, uh, just very quickly, kind of um, some other uh, scenarios that I'd heard that, poten that people uh, potentially wanted to look at uh, across marine areas from the last forecast meeting. Um, I think we heard, uh, particularly in Marine Area 7 in the winter, we heard kind of a proposal of what a non-selective fishery would look like. So that is modeled here. Um, we also looked, for example, at um, kind of, let me scroll down to it, increasing the size limits in summer fisheries from 22 to 24 inches. So once again, that is also modeled here. Um, but um, kind of, um, I, I guess what I would say is as we're thinking about potentially what are uh, some of the modeled scenarios, um, I would encourage folks to kind of download this tool online and put the X's in the boxes themselves, see if there's something that kind of makes sense to them that they'd like to present to the general group or um, either now or send us an email on it later and uh, provide some feedback on what, what you think might be a good direction. But um, anyway, um, for today, I'm not going to go through each of the marine areas in depth. As I said, I'd kind of tried to align some of the things that I was thinking for each of the marine areas. If you're scrolling through on your own computer or have questions as I'm scrolling through about a particular action, uh, of course, please feel free to uh, come up and, and ask a question about it. Um, but um, maybe that's a good place to pause and see if there are any questions before I walk through kind of some potential scenarios that I think we've been considering on what our seasons might look like this year for Chinook. All right. Oh, Gabe. Thanks. So, um, you know, I, looking through this uh, catch per day methodology that you're looking at using here, um, have we noticed a correlation between? Uh, you know, perhaps poor ocean conditions and residualization of Chinook showing up in those areas early in the season where we're seeing those anomaly, potential anomalies happen where, you know, Area 11 in June, San Juans in early July in 2021. And could that perhaps be contributing to why we're seeing those abnormally high catch rates in those areas early in the season? That's a really good question, and um, and and I think you've picked up on something that's an important difference between the methods. Uh, t historically, we've actually used this effort-based approach more because it, it has tended to perform better. The effort-based approach inherently incorporates kind of abundance into, into its modeling of quotas, um, and that can be a, a big advantage. Um, I think as far as the catch per day goes, as we look at this, there uh, isn't that there isn't as strong of a correlation to um, uh, abundance as we 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 might have as we might have seen in the past. So maybe maybe I'll provide an example for that that you might be familiar with, uh, Gabe. Let me just pull open a good one here, maybe for Marine Area Eleven. I guess where I'm going with that is if you look at coded wire tag recoveries in those time periods, it's not the normal stocks that you would see in those areas at, you know, in, in the summer fisheries. 
So for example, uh, uh, one of the ones that really popped out as a, a big anomaly last year, Area 11 June, um, it, was, um, it was great to kind of have that for a second year in a row as we were closed for a, a few years on that one. Um, and that's one historically that's that's been a um, uh, an important fishery, but um, maybe a little bit lower catch than a lot of the other summer fisheries in Puget Sound. And if I look at kind of a recent five-year average of the catch per day that we saw when that was open between 2015 to 2018, and then 2021, once again, there's a little bit of a gap in years where that was closed. Um, I mean, the average catch per day was 26, and last year it was only open for three days because the average catch per day was 220. So, <laughs> um, um, and that's, um, that, that was kind of um, maybe one of the fisheries where I, um, where, where, where I did, you know, where, where I, I definitely noticed that, but that's a trend that we see across a lot of our fisheries. So anyway, going back to area 11 and abundance, um, you might remember that 2017 and 2018 were, were two great years of South Sound abundance. They were two years where we really saw kind of from the years previous where that South Sound abundance was lower. We saw a rebound. We saw great hatchery return in those two years. Um, the average catch per day in those two years of higher abundance was uh, 32.8, once again, compared to 220 of last year. So um, not 100% sure, once again, if that's an anomaly, if that's a trend, um, exactly what's going on there. But um, it does make the modeling more challenging and perhaps uh, riskier this year to keeping seasons open. Sure. All right. Thank you. I don't remember exactly what the seasons were in which area, but I wonder if that catch rate was attributed to an increased pressure because in area 11 last year, I never remember seeing the amount of boats in area 11. And I think some of the other areas being closed might have caused a shift and a higher um, angler effort in that area. I think that's a really good insight and something that I've been thinking about, particularly for the winter fisheries. Uh, the winter fisheries where there's been closures in more recent years relative to what we've seen in the past, um, uh, particularly marine areas 10, 11, and 5, we need a much larger quota to model those fisheries than we would have, say, uh, five years ago. Um, on average, this is this is one of those pieces that I looked at. On average, uh, from the period of 2014 to 2018, on average between those two fisheries, the uh, the catch per day needed to model 2022 versus the average in that set of years is up by 500%. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Um, I, I, I liked one of the things that I heard you say, and it was kind of where can we get the biggest bang for our buck with our available um, quota that we have and with the impacts that we allow. And I think that it's really important that we look at the number of angler trips that we can get with where we provide the opportunity. So um, staying away from the areas where we have bigger impacts makes a lot of sense. And I know I realize, you know, a lot of us travel to fish all over the state. And so getting the most angler days, I think is really key. And I just want, I, I heard you mention you were looking at modeling some of those things. And I think that that's a great thing. I, I, I appreciate that, Rob, and maybe that's a good segue kind of into the next portion, because as I've been looking at different scenarios, there's different options that we could take for this year. We could take options of, of trying to maximize that, that, that fishery catch uh, in areas that have lower impact on, say, Stiligwamish, or we could take kind of, um, uh, we'll get into it in just a second, like I said, but on kind of the uh, extra impacts that we might want to model in this first model run for Stiligwamish. Um, I, I, I think we could potentially take a look at bolstering some of those marine areas that are more expensive on Stiligwamish, but have been more reduced in the past. So that, that's something that I'm really going to be looking for feedback uh, from this group and from uh, folks online too, um, for kind of helping us shape where we go with our first package. We do have one hand that's been up online. Yep, our next hand is from Kyle again. Kyle, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to provide feedback on on that sort of trade off um, discussion there. I, you know, I personally, just as a you know sport fisherman, I I would rather have uh, you know a season that closes to uh, closes early or after only a few days um, due to really high catch rate than seasons that don't open at all because we you know, took a year or two years of data and said, well, this might be a long-term trend. And, and so we need this big quota to support this. 
Um, and so then we sort of limit which seasons open. I, I think I, I would just, you know, want to see more of that confirmed trend or some other properties that we can correlate to say that this is definitely going to be a repeat um, scenario. Uh, that's just, just from, I don't know if I'm alone in that from a sport fishing standpoint, but I would think that, I would think that others would, would feel similarly about um, the trade-off there. Thank you, Kyle. All right, so not seeing any other hands in the room and Kyle, we don't have any online. Um, so maybe um, we can move into kind of um, uh, some scenarios that we've been that we've been thinking about here. Um, as so um, we have considered um, taking taking a starting place where we use kind of the recent seasons and use kind of that catch per day uh, methodology to say, uh, if we updated using this method, uh, here's what the resulting quota would be, and here's what the impacts would be. However, we kind of very quickly saw that as we did that, we uh, went quite a bit over on our Stiligwamish mortalities. So instead, um, kind of for the two scenarios that we've prepared today, um, uh, we're looking at kind of using um, the effort-based methodology to model the same season as last year, recognizing that if 2022 was not anomalous on that catch per day that we saw, that it would probably cause early closures in, in many of our areas. Um, and if we do that, um, we can do that by, um, by we're going to check some boxes here, um, right here, row 22, for marine area uh, 5, for uh, marine area win uh, marine area 5 in the winter, we can, uh, if we don't check any of these, it'll keep the same quota. For marine area 6 in the summer, we can check row 34. For marine area 6 in the winter, we don't check any boxes. For marine area seven in the summer, if we don't check any boxes, we keep the same quota. Uh, same with the winter. Moving down to row 56. This is updating marine area nine in the summer. 63, marine area 10 in the summer. 72, marine area 11 in the summer uh, for June. And then 74 for um, July through September. Um, I guess now is a good place to mention. While I did, um, while I did suggest checking only one box per marine area in my um, uh, uh, initial opening here, um, I would say that marine area seven um, is, or marine area eleven is a little bit different. I did model June and July to September separately. So if you have scenarios for both of those, uh, check the two boxes: one for June and one for July through September as you go through that. Um, and then checking box 80. This kind of gives us the same uh, seasons that were modeled as, as last year um, uh, is what this would do. And as we, as we check all those boxes, we see on these Stiligwamish mortalities, we're coming out at 89.4 uh, on the mortalities. As I kind of mentioned at the beginning, I think that a good place in the first model run is to target about 100 mortalities. That's a little bit over uh, what we might have in the final modeling, but it's a, it, it might be a good, a, a good starting place. So that leaves us 11 mortalities to work with. And this is where I've prepared kind of uh, two scenarios that deviate from this, this base scenario that I put on screen now. The first scenario could be to use those 11 mortalities to, once again, as I mentioned, uh, bolster areas that have had some of the greatest decreases in recent years. So that would be marine area seven and nine. And the scenario that I looked at potentially for that is, um, is up here, marine area seven, is this one. So modeling uh, nine days open, um, but using that catch per day methodology to update to um, uh, maybe a stronger effort than um, uh, th that occurred last year. And uh, so if we check that, we can see kind of the impact that it has on Stiligwamish is it adds an additional seven mortalities to our tool. And if we look at the top of the screen here, we can see we're at 96.2. So beyond that, what I did was I looked at how many, um, how many, how much additional catch we could add into marine area nine to get to that total of 11 mortalities. And as it turns out, that's um, approximately 1,700. Adding that amount to the quota would, would, would get us there. In total, um, if we took those actions, um, it would um, increase our catch by approximately 2,500 um, relative to what it was last year. Um, but it, that 2,500 would be in some of the marine areas that might be in the most need of it. Um, a second scenario that I looked at 
was I looked at using those 11 mortalities to bolster areas that maximize the catch per Stiligwamish impacts. And the places where we tend to have the lowest Stiligwamish impacts per, um, uh, uh, per quota are in marine areas 6, 10, and 11 in the summer. So starting off with marine area 10, we could change this X so that it's the box below and update that quota from uh, approximately 4,000 fish to approximately 5,200 fish. We could then also go up to marine area six in the summer and take away this X and change it to over here using that catch per day methodology to bolster our quota to a very healthy one of uh, uh, from 6, 000, a quota of 6,000 to 87.58. And then, um, and then what I would do is we could then take kind of, um, as we did for marine areas seven and nine, we could take kind of um, uh, what additional impacts we could add into marine area 11 um, to achieve uh, 100 stiligwamish mortalities. And by my calculations, that's adding 4,000 additional quota to marine area 11 in the summertime. So um, I see Gabe's hand raised, but I just wanted to do one quick recap um, here, which is, um, so in comparison between scenario one and two, um, I'm looking at um, potentially um, in scenario one, uh, in marine areas seven and nine, a combined additional quota of 2,500 in, in scenario two, uh, across marine areas six, 10, and 11 in the summer, having an additional quota of about 8,000 fish. So um, Gabe? So I don't think it's any secret to anybody in this room. I'm a South Sound fisherman, and for my own, uh, you know, personal benefit, I'd like to see fish used in the South Sound. But it's, um, you know, as a statesman and a representative of the fishermen of Washington State, it'd be really helpful to know what those angler trips represent. You know, I, you know, dead fish are dead fish, but what's the CPUE in those areas and how many people are we going to be able to get out fishing? And I think that's the most important thing to me. And hopefully for all of us is how can we create the most opportunity with the impacts that we have? I, I do appreciate that Gabe. And, and, and I agree. Um, I, um, I, um, I, I did hope, like I said, to have the angler trips in on here. And I, uh, I guess I was slacking because I, I didn't get to okay, maybe at the next North Falcon. Let's see. That, um, that, that sounds good. We'll try to get that into the next one. I, I think it helps give everybody a, a better understanding of what's really going on and how we can get people out on the water as much as possible. So that's my two cents. Thanks. Thank you. And um, before we kind of get additional questions, there was one other piece that I thought was uh, uh, important to kind of consider as we're considering between option uh, scenario one and scenario two which is kind of these uh, secondary stocks that are, that, that are impacted by the choices that we make. Uh, we definitely wanna be paying attention to our impacts on the Squally particularly, um, and potentially Skokomish as well. Um, area six, as we bolster that, um, that is one that has an effect both on South Sound and on Skokomish, uh, particularly on Skokomish. Um, and area 11 um, and, and 10 are ones that have a greater impact on the Squally. So, as we run through these modeling scenarios, those are two additional stocks we'll want to be looking at. Um, Carl, then Pat. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, bless your heart, Derek, the, the burden of slicing up a pie, uh, you know, and the, the, the needs of this, you know, beautiful state and all beautiful fish and so many hungry anglers. It's, uh, I can't imagine. Um, well, you know, something that makes me very nervous is the thought of, you know, bolstering a summer quota with Chinook that, that's going to increase a still a Guamish take uh, during a time frame that's going to be open already for pinks and coho. So, you know, the meat on the bones of a winter fisheries in Washington is like, a, it's starting to look like a filleted black mouth. It's just like, you know, a couple pieces of meat hanging off of a skeleton. And, 
you know, from my perspective, it's really important that we find a way to preserve these winter fisheries. And I strongly encourage these fisheries to be implemented in a way and in areas that have the least impact on Stillaguamish Chinook until we get out of that hole. And, it, you know, hopefully that continues to improve. We saw some improvement this year. We know how these trends go. They don't, they're not linear. They go up and down. We're going to see problems in the future with Stillaguamish again. I really would like to see winter fisheries in areas that can make responsible use of Stillaguamish Chinook. And I get very uncomfortable at the thought of increasing summer quotas with those fish at a time, again, when we can harvest coho and pinks in those areas. I understand we do have Chinook release encounters, you know, um, you know, mortality is associated with those pink and coho fisheries. I will be participating in this process through to the end. And I'm probably going to be jumping up and down March and 10, March and 11, March and 5, you know, that, those kinds of things. But however, you know, I'm willing to listen to these ideas and and get some sidebars with Pat and and the department about you know more broad winter openings. I I can't fathom the idea of giving up, you know, eight weeks in other areas for nine days and seven. It's going to be hard to get on board with that. But um, I'll I'll keep listening. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. I appreciate that. And uh, folks um, around this room, sorry, I just want to respond to Carl fast first. Um, folk, folks in this room will know, I, I've, I've heard uh, what people have said about winter fisheries and about uh, in the forecast meeting and, and, and otherwise. And uh, as we were looking at some of these scenarios, we were really trying to game out and uh, carve out how we could how we could get there. And I'm not saying it's uh, I'm not saying it's something that's not possible, but even looking at some of these smaller openings in winter fisheries, particularly in marine areas uh, six, seven, uh, nine, and to lesser of extent, but also eight as well, it is really expensive for the quota that that, that it takes. So uh, maybe using marine area six as an example, uh, for this 15 days of fishing, a quota of 1,300 fish, we're looking at almost nine Stillaguamish impacts. So if we were to take that base scenario we could squeeze potentially 15 days of fishing in marine area six, but there wouldn't be much room for, for, for much else. And as we kind of look down the scenarios um, uh, with, the four, with the 11 fish that we have to work with, um, looking at kind of what might be necessary in marine area seven in the winter, even the, even the 15 days uh, kind of exceeds that, that, that 11 right off the bat. So I think kind of some of the words that you spoke there, Carl, um, were, were, were more directed at trying to maximize our winter opportunity in areas where the Stillaguamish, uh, the effects are less. And um, in the base scenarios, we, we do have kind of the winter seasons in five, 10 and 11 modeled as they are. The one caveat that I would put there is uh, area five winter is one of the ones where we really have been seeing the biggest increase in that catch per day. So kind of modeling what we had last year, uh, it, uh, it'll be interesting to see next year if we did have that quota how far we would make it into that that march and april season and I, i'm sorry i know that uh uh art and pat had your hands raised i think pat had his hand raised first if he still had a question we, we did have a hand up that's been online too if we could go to that and then art yep zachary uh, go ahead all right thank you i'll keep this uh pretty quick first i just wanted to put in a plug for the uh in, the increase that sell the row 84 that increasing the size limit for the summer um in five six seven and nine i you know i think that that's a pretty efficient savings and i mean i think that would be if for you know when it comes down to finding crafting additional opportunity that's something that's not changing our time on the water but that's getting us savings and i think that you know for a lot of folks uh, 
you know, fish that are in that 22, 23 size range are not really what we're chasing in the summer. Those are a lot more of like your black mouth. Um, and I think especially in years like this where we're, you know, that's, I think that'd be a, a good thing to consider. And then secondly, I wanted to sort of put in a push for, you know, trying to prevent effort shift and look at this effort overlap. You know, I, it's not particularly scientific, but when I look at this catch per day, I think that there's a lot to be said uh, for some effort shift that's really going on. And I think that can be as much from this sort of general fear and sort of expectation that fisheries are going to close, that folks are, you know, really getting out there right at the beginning of seasons just to make sure they get some time on the water. And, you know, I, I do wonder about, um, particularly for the winter, I don't know if there's a, a reason that Area 11's traditionally had that November, December season, but, you know, considering an overlap with Area 10, and potentially when looking to expand some winter opportunity, because I, I, uh, I, I forgive me for forgetting the name of who just spoke, but I also, you know, feel that the the winter is a really unique time that is increasing, it's taking salmon fishing from a from a just a summer activity to something that's really you know year round and sort of helps with the the community side of it. And so potentially like a nine and ten opening at the same time. I know there's a lot of fleet overlap there um, that I think would be potentially helpful in sort of bolstering both of those areas. And one last thing on that is that area nine winter seems to be the most efficient on a per stilly mortality of the blackmouth seasons that are five, like relative to five, six, seven, and eight. Nine seems to be more efficient than those ones. So if we were looking to expand winter a little bit, nine seems a very prime uh, opportunity, particularly if overlapped with area 10. Thank you for those thoughts, Zachary. Um, I guess maybe um, going through some of them and maybe seeing if uh, Mark or anybody else has anything additional to add to what, what, what I speak to here. Um, I think uh, maybe starting with Area 11 in uh, March and April, kind of overlapping that with Area 10, I think that's kind of, uh, we've heard similar comments from some of our advisors. Uh, after we get done the meeting here, we'll have a little bit of an internal huddle up uh, on that one. The one thing I think that's worth considering in Marine Area 11 as we kind of push it later and later into that winter season is uh, there can be co-manager concern, particularly for White River Springs. So we'll kind of we'll, we'll kind of we'll kind of talk through that a little bit. But I I, I do think uh, kind of um, your concerns about uh, effort shift um, and what we're seeing in the winter, not only in Marine Area 11 but potentially in other places. Um, I have considered that as we're as we're going through the modeling, um, and and I um, I do wonder if kind of some of those increases that we see is is due to closures in other areas. Um, oh, lastly, on kind of the the size limit that you mentioned, that's um, I, I I heard that we'll 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 also chat um, kind of internally um, after this meeting uh, about that option. Thank you, Pat. Did you still have a question? Oh, Mark. Getting back to kind of um, the uh, quota, summertime quotas that you mentioned earlier, I'm happy to hear those comments. Um, something I've been looking at for a number of years and kind of apprehensive about bringing it up. But uh, some of those northern fisheries have uh, pretty extensive quotas compared to Marine Area 11. And uh, Marine Area 11, for example, uh, doesn't have as many impacts. So uh, uh, I think uh, as our fishery down there in that area, which I've been involved in for uh, almost 50 years, working there in the recreational fishing industry and seeing all the angler trips and the potential there. Um, it's a heavily used area, a lot of trips, and overall, uh, the success rate is really not that good for how many people go out there. Um, so uh, I think it's a good opportunity to um, provide more opportunity during the summer months and have a, a fewer impacts in, than elsewhere. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Art. So trying to keep alternating, we have one hand up online, then you, Pat. And Kurt, go ahead. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Carl made a comment about, you know, hanging in until we, the Chinook, the Stoguam and Chinook get better. The reality is, most of us in this room will be long gone and no longer fishing and the Stoguamish Nooks are still gonna be a problem. Uh, the 2020 
co-manager at RAF management plan that they put together had a run reconstruction table on the Stoguamish that ran from 1990 through 2013. In the 90s, the decade before the Stoguamish and the Puget Sound Chinooks were listed, um, the average escapement was about 11,900 fish, and they produced about 1,381 recruits, or about 1.16 spawners re recruits. In the, in the 2000s, 2000 to 2013, uh, the statement was increased by 291 fish. Everybody listening to this or sitting in that room realized how painful it was to get those 291 fish on the spawning grounds. We bled, we literally sweated blood to get those fish on the spawning grounds. The, the managers and all the fishers sacrificed a lot to get those there's fish. And the number of recruits that those fish produced was 438 less fish than was produced in the 1990s. It's getting worse and it's getting worse off really, really quickly. The recruits responders in the 2000s was about two thirds of a fish a piece. In other words, in the 1990s, for every 20 fish we put on the spawning grounds, we got 23 back. In the 2000s, for every 20 fish we put on the spawning grounds, we got 13 back. Now, I'm not the best mathematician in this discussion, but I think that's a pretty depressing situation. And you know, we're gonna have to figure out how to get better and better at using Silgwami Chinook impacts if we're gonna have fish on the grounds, because it's gonna be with uh, certainly all the state's people's rest of their careers. I'm pretty confident. I've taken a pretty deep dive into the Stoguamish, and it's not going to get better any, very quickly at all. The, the, the flooding is just absolutely depressing on that basin. And uh, I mean, we have to figure out how to use those fish as wisely as we can, deciding how we want to use those. And, you know, it's it's going to be in for the long haul. It just, that's reality, and we're not going to be able to escape it. And I'm, I'm sorry I'm downy, um, a downer, but that's I think we need to put things in some reality and understand where we're going with this. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. And um, I will say I appreciated the conversation that we had on this uh, uh, recently um, and um, kind of um, just confirming, kind of uh, looking at some of those spawner recruit numbers. Um, there are very few years uh, in the recent series where we are exceeding uh, one, uh, a ratio of one spawner per recruit. Um, uh, for Stiligwamish. Uh, that hatchery program uh, is of uh, great importance to supplementing uh, the wild population, kind of given the trends that we're uh, seeing up there. Um, and um, just also a comment that you mentioned on the flooding. Um, I, um, uh, I think in the MEP, actually, there's a, a regression that shows kind of uh, the effect of out-migrating smolts versus flooding, and uh, there does seem to be a, a, a trend there. So I appreciate those insights, Kurt. Thank you. Um, I sure appreciate Kurt's comments. <laughs> and we are going to be around for a long time, aren't we, Kurt? Um, but that's the stuff that uh, we're not really, we can't do anything about, because we got to focus on fisheries right here. Decisions are being made. Um, Derek. Um, I really appreciate you taking charge and going for a proposal that's kind of like a, uh, I suppose, a, a, a straw man or whatever you'd call that. I couldn't follow it quite and and uh, didn't see all of the maneuvers that you made there, but I bet they're good ideas. And the concern I have is that uh, um, even though I, I have a lot of, of uh, trust in your good judgment, and you're, you're, you have understanding about the fisheries themselves as well as the, the technical issues. I'm a little bit worried that we won't understand a proposal that's, that goes to the tribes. Um, so, uh, uh, but let me, let me just then summarize things that I think have to be addressed. And I, I think what you're addressing there is uh, 
seeing where there's kind of a hot fishery based on recent experience, uh, like area six, um, a lot of fish caught there. Um, area five too, maybe, but area six also has that lower impact. So probably a good place to consider increased numbers for the purpose of attempting to lower the risk of having to take in season management and stabilizing the fishery. As if, if I look at it globally, I think that's one of the real priorities of the department. I think you've ad you addressed it really well last year. And the, my favorite example is in seven, where you made adjustments in fisheries going to the partial weeks. And I think that proved to be, a, and also moving it away from the July 4th weekend, smart moves. And I think that's the kind of thing, but I, I worry that every year changing fisheries around, that's not a good move because it's destabilizing the fisheries that people are, it'd be great to have a pattern from year to year that was really pretty similar. There's an advantage that has come out of the modeling I see is that the impacts, the total impacts uh, with last year's fisheries are pretty close, it looks like. And I, I think that if, if I see a success out of this year's fisheries, it's that if you could have something pretty similar with the Chinook opportunity last year, and you add there's more coho, maybe a little bit of additional coho room in some places, especially in the area where there's relaxation of Snohomish, which was such a tight one, and you've got pink salmon, I think it could be a pretty darn good year in 2023. So um, there's still some things that could be done, but don't change it wholesale. Uh, so address some of the hot areas. Uh, try to address, the, for example, the aligning of winter seasons. I think that's a really good idea. So adjust those seasons a bit. I think especially areas 10 and 11 in winter, having that March opener is a, a really smart thing and it you know distributes the effort. I think you would see an effect. You won't know it in any one year, but I think that's a smart thing. I think you could probably have uh, a area seven fishery, a winter fishery in there too, if, it, if it's found that you can afford something. I'm afraid that it might not be very big, might start on the same date, but it uh, probably wouldn't last as long. Um, but I think it's worth trying to get that winter fishery, just something there. Maybe it has to be matched with the sampling program when you've already got a program uh, open for other fisheries. Maybe it's, uh, but just having something back there, there's this real strong concern out there in the public that once you cut a fishery for reasons that you had to, conservation primarily, you never get it back. And I don't think it has to be that way in area seven. I think something really small would still be really valuable and a greatly appreciated, uh, even if it was a three-day opener. I mean, it sounds crazy, but I think it would be appreciated. I also think that the size limit increase in area seven, we, I, I couldn't hear everything you had up there, but I don't think you've gotten around to that analysis yet, Derek, or did you have it here? I, I did, but I didn't break out the areas separately. I think yeah. I heard uh, in the proposal in the forecast meeting, I think I heard kind okay. of doing a combined. Yes. So that's and right. I wasn't, so I, it, that's pretty darn hard to see. So I, sorry, so I haven't been able to, to analyze that, but I'm, I'm hoping that that for area seven, that that has an effect. And I think that's an example of where you might do something. I think people in, in fish in seven would, well, they, I've tried to get the word out to people I know that fish in seven, and it seems like the 24 inch size limit, you saw some of that's related to the gear stuff. There's bigger fish there per sublegal. And it's also in the model. Uh, sublegal proportions are really different. So 
doing that in area seven, a little bit of summer for some winter, a small amount of winter, I think it, it kind of, maybe it pays for itself. Um, it's not like everybody has to do something in, it's a perfect balance between areas right now, but it's, this is one of those examples that you might tweak, you might use it one area size limit, not broadly. Um, another uh, idea that uh, I want to, again, emphasize, I'm, I'm a salesman here. Uh, this is the total mortality index that I'm not trying to coin a, a uh, acronym or anything, but, but I think uh, from what we had discussed, you, you've considered this, you've thought about it. I, good points, uh, Kyle, you had several and uh, it's going to be a tough push for, for this year to do it broadly, certainly, maybe at all. But my suggestion is that you try it in the winter in areas 10 and 11. Clearly had issues uh, there with some of like the unmarked uh, total encounters uh, was a driver for 10 most recently. And I think the total mortality index approach is... Uh, a good one there. I think it's a good fit. I think it makes a big difference. And it's not like you're trying to avoid impacts. You're actually calculating the impacts to protect you from the most constraining stock, the Stiligwamish stocks impacts. You're, you're accounting for that. You're being responsible in addressing uh, your share of the conservation and the control of fisheries impacts uh, in those fisheries by using an index like that and also receiving the benefit of having more stable fisheries, I think, with one metric controlling the fisheries, the fishery control rather than multiple. Um, so my pitch is try that again, but um, those are my thoughts for, for right now. There's still a lot to be thought about in, in COHO and I think it probably requires modeling, but one overall, said, I, I still really think that there's value in going to the tribes for you to go to the tribes with more than one modeling proposal or a proposal to model that represents a range of kind of high and low, uh, uh, more uh, a variety. There's a variety of things that people are proposing, but have some contrast. and try to get out of this first round of working with the tribes and negotiating this first step before our next public meeting, come back with, a, with more information for us, more contrasts so that we can continue this public consideration and process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. And um, uh, maybe I'll start with, um, uh, there, there's a lot there. Um, so maybe I'll start with uh, kind of some of the modeling um, ideas that you'd proposed. Um, and I think I heard, just to make sure I capture them all, uh, take a look at bolstering the hot areas, adjusting marine areas 10 and 11 in the winter to have greater alignment, and maybe looking at a size limit. Um, I think um, I've also heard support from other folks around this room for some of those ideas, so we can check those out. I think the other one that was that we, we hadn't heard quite yet was taking a look at marine area uh, seven in the summer and seeing what adjustments could potentially be made there, maybe the size limits, maybe maybe otherwise to look at kind of how is there room to take a bit from that and carve out a potential winter fishery. So we'll take a look at we'll take a look at that as well. Thank you. Oh, um, I suppose, and on the other piece, you mentioned that I went through the tool fairly quickly as I was outlining the scenarios, and I recognize that I did. Um, so um, if you'd like, um, afterwards, I'd be happy to kind of walk you through what I've been looking at. We have a question online from Tom. Tom, go ahead. Thanks, and and Derek, thanks for uh, all, all the effort you put into that modeling tool too. It's 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 very helpful, and and very illustrative of the challenges that 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 everybody's been trying to address today. Um, I I would support uh, Pat Patillo's comments with regard to not necessarily throwing the baby out with the bat bathwater and having a more consistent approach to the seasons. I I lean towards your uh, 
your enhanced scenario one, but maybe there's a, a balance we can strike between giving something back to an area that's absolutely suffered the biggest cuts, area seven. Area nines also, you know, suffer these cuts as well. But maybe there's a balance where where we can provide a few more, you know, fish down to area 10, down to area 11. But uh, I, I would also agree and, and, and ask you to very, very carefully look at adding some opportunity back in seven in the wintertime. Again, with, you know, with the possible exception of Marine Area 8 that, that, that's had absolutely no opportunity at all, Area 7 has been cut more severely than any other area in the state. And that's, thank you very much. I appreciate your, your efforts today. Thank you, Tom. Any other questions on uh, online, either Kyle or Leah? Nope, none online. Not seeing any more questions in the room. Maybe I'll pass it over to Mark for a quick wrap up. Yeah, I don't know if Chad's available to put the uh, presentation back up on screen. Um, just uh, want to remind folks, we do have some public meetings coming up next week. Uh, Monday and Thursday will be Puget Sound centric meetings uh, via Zoom in the evening. Those uh, those links are available on our website. Again, we'll we'll probably get into a little bit more freshwater fisheries discussion at those, as well as continue uh, the marine discussion. Um, and again, uh, even if uh, folks have suggestions online or here in the room about just general priorities uh, related to fishing seasons, you know, even if they're not specifically related to the tools that have been developed to help evaluate things, um, you know, happy to listen to those comments today too, uh, you know. There are some uh, underloved uh, or under talked about fisheries that maybe uh, one suggestion we've taken recently to help uh, with some of the the imbalance in the canal is an additional uh, fish in the daily limit um, in the South Canal fishery. Um, that that's been a suggestion. So just if there's any other questions or comments uh, about other fisheries, um, great time to to bring those forward. As I said, we we put the calendar up here. Uh, we will be coming back together as a as a larger group um, towards the end of the month here in Linwood. Uh, it is going to be again a hybrid meeting, so we will have both the in person uh, and online options available to us. Um, so far, so good this year. It's it's worked out okay after being several years uh, virtual um, with the help of uh, other folks from the agency. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and Leah. So with that, uh, kind of the next steps and, and Pat alluded, alluded to it in, in some of his comments, uh, our plan as a department is to take the, the public comments re we've received to date and some of the modeling options and uh, uh, really this evening uh, together with uh, Director Susuin and, and Kelly Cunningham from the FISH program, kind of come up with a preferred uh, proposal to take to the tribes for modeling. Um, our modeling staff is actually gonna be hard at work to work on that tonight, uh, as we will be together with our co-managers tomorrow to kind of talk through uh, both the co-manager modeling inputs and, and our modeling inputs as a, as a first proposal uh, for this year's fisheries. Looking around the room, seeing if there's any other questions or comments. Go ahead, Carl. Uh, just, just to coattail on Pat a little bit, um, on again on the winter fisheries is that you know, and you were talking about ten and eleven simultaneously. You know, area five is in there too. It, it's basically what we're talking about guys getting on trailers and going to the fishery. And so if you open five and 10 and 11 at the same time, I, I think you are going to see a greatly reduced effort and, and it might, it's not going to solve your problem, but it will probably curtail some of this 
you know, this drastic increase you're seeing in effort and, uh, and uh, it might help you out a little bit on, on this trend we're seeing in, in increased effort. And, and boy, do we need that relief. I mean, right now, it, it's particularly in the winter fisheries, but in all of our fisheries. So simultaneous openings might be something that we're going to see. And the, other, the other thing um, that we all notice, in, in our, particularly in our winter fisheries, is that we see this drastic abundance in juveniles once every, I don't know, four or five, six years, we see this just tremendous abundance in sublegal fish. And maybe they just decide not to go out to the ocean. Or they find food and they just don't travel as fast. So this is going to translate next year into some really good winter opportunity in the areas that we do find fisheries and probably not as many sublegal fish. So I, I'm looking forward to that opportunity and whatever you guys end up crafting, I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. And I have, a, I think, a little bit of a tough question as a, a follow-up maybe for you or sure. for the folks in this room. Um, as I mentioned, um, as we're looking at Marine Area 11, we're going we're, we're gonna to consider kind of changing that time period. We'll talk about that, as I said, internally tonight. If we run into co-manager issues with that, if, if they uh, say if there's issues with White River Springs or if there's reasons why the co-managers uh, give really strong pushback to moving that around, um, would the preference, would, would there be any appetite for moving area five and area 10 early? And the reason why I say that might be a tough question is because I know in marine area 10, kind of the earlier we move that period, there's more sublegals. And I know for marine area five, if we were to move that period earlier, the weather isn't quite as good prior to March and April. So my guess is that we probably would would not want to do that if 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 that came up as an option to align seasons is rather than moving 11, later moving the other seasons earlier, but I wanted to kind of confirm and make sure that that is a correct train of thought there. Right, like I can't speak for area five, but I really know that those guys, the weather is really important to them. I don't I don't think they can move much earlier. Um, and, and, you know, everything that you said there, Derek is spot on. I mean, it, it's, it's you, you run into more sublegals early, earlier and we're concerned now. We do know that that strategy of uh, we tried in 2022 of opening the fishery in area 10 as a four day a week fishery, then pausing it and getting an evaluation on our stock composition that worked pretty well. So that, that's another part to consider. You know, you write it up in the loaf as a seven day a week fishery. I, I mean, the only the big question on that is is sort of, and this isn't the question you asked me, of course, but but you know, is is your resource and how much it, it takes you to be able to to make you know to evaluate that. But um, but you know, you might have to look at taking two out of those three areas and making them simultaneous um, rather than all of them. But eleven might have to be its own animal in that case. Thank you, Carl. I really appreciate that and uh, the knowledge that you have on those fisheries. And it and looks like we do have one hand online. Yep. Brandon, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, we here in Marine Area 5, if we moved up any earlier than we are, I mean, historically, we would start February 15th, 16th, and uh, it's just not really even worth putting the docks in here because they just get torn up we get a lot of easterlies and stuff and it's it's rough enough just to put in march 1st for the first couple of weeks we we get uh we get hit pretty hard especially the last two years and this year it seems like every week we get an easterly and i don't even have all the docks put in uh just just to kind of protect my assets for now and compared to like last year this year there's way less effort i think a lot of that has to do with probably the economy and the weather but uh like today and yesterday there's only been 10 boats leaving the docks so it's it's and i would say four four or five of those boats are bottom fishing. So we don't really have a lot of, a lot of effort right now going on on salmon fishing. Um, but yeah, area five would not want to move up any earlier for sure. 
Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Appreciate those insights. And so I think I, I think what I'm hearing from the group is we'll we'll take a look at moving uh, Marine Area 11 to March and April. If that's not feasible, uh, keep things as they are for Marine Area 10 and 5, given the considerations we heard, and uh, keep Area 11 as it is too. If 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 we run into challenges with that. Any other hands up online, Kyle? Yes, one more online. <laughs> Hi, I'll go ahead. Thank you. Um, this is Kyle again. I, isn't uh, 10 uh, usually open um, into March? So uh, I think the the concern from a, a, a marine area 10 angler is, is, um, is along the lines of uh, if you open it later aligned with five uh and you even get less time at least you'll actually get that season rather than you know like we open on february 1st you encounter a lot of shorts and it's closed on you know after 11 days or whatever so even if it went from march 1st to you know if it was just the month of march or halfway through march i think you'd still have more opportunity um than uh and maybe it would go longer and spread out the op you know um rather than you know, encountering all the sublegals. Thank you, Zach. Does the co-manager concern more come up in uh, stretching it into April? I guess. I guess that's. You know, like where does that? If it's all, if it's normally supposed to be open through March. Would that be um, a place of, of pushback? Yeah, in um, in my experience in co-manager discussions, uh, kind of there, there there can be concern about those White River Springs. Uh, the the closer we get to kind of the timing of their return, I know that um, uh, kind of in in years past, when we've looked either at May in Area Eleven or in June in Area Eleven, there's been concerns there. And I don't know, I, I can't remember any discussions on April, but that's kind of uh, one of the things that I that that I might anticipate. Um, Derek, I just want a better understanding of the test per day. How, what, what did you do to figure that formula? What goes into that formula to determine that? It's uh, it's extremely simplistic. It simply looks at kind of the number of the days that the season was open and then the catch and uh, it's one divided by the other. Um, so there are some considerations there. Like I said, that doesn't take into account abundance. That doesn't take into account, for example, when the fishery was open necessarily and say if it was open in July versus September. So there are some weaknesses with that approach. Um, as I'd mentioned, I typically tend to use the effort-based approach, which takes into account abundance, takes into account kind of changes within uh, months across kind of a, a season. Mm -hmm. um, um, but, uh, but, but it is kind of a, a, a valuable metric to look at, I think. And in rare situations, historically, it has outperformed the effort-based method. Okay, so it doesn't have anything to do with, with um, actual physical effort or how many anglers are, or boats are for, for, on no. the water? No. no, for the catch per day, no. It's just, it's just simply the number of catch divided by the number of days. Oh, okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Well, once again, I'd really, really appreciate everybody's uh, attention today. Um, appreciative to all the staff and, and field staff who are online to put all this information together uh, for us to consider uh, with fishing seasons. Um, thank you for your participation and your comments. Um, we look forward to seeing you again at our next meeting. And again, uh, if you have other ideas, feel free to reach out to us in one of the, uh, you know, through the email, um, tons of information online, as well as the public comment portal. We are looking at that uh, when making fisheries considerations. So uh, please don't hesitate to provide your thoughts and comments there. 
uh, if you're uh, reluctant to do so here within the meeting. Um, but thanks again, everybody. Uh, look forward to the next time we're together. Have a great day.